You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the fifth anniversary of the Center Steer Podcast. This is show number 60 for March 2018. This is the first Land Rover podcast on the planet, and this is a podcast by four and about Land Rover owners. I'm your host, John Costage, from the studios outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Joining me via Skype, uh, Harold, also from Pennsylvania. Morgan from Vermont, who heads up seriesparts.com. And uh, Mike from South Carolina, who heads up justbritish.com. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me again. Uh, but yes, welcome back. And also, a special guest hiding behind the scenes is uh, David Short. You'll hear more from him later. You can say hi, David. Hi, everybody. If you're watching on video, and and spoiler, there is no video, uh, David makes wonderful facial expressions. (laughs) We should have that as a bonus feed for for the Patreon people. Watch uh, David do his uh, mime impression. Uh, We have two guests this month. Uh, Both are related to the first Overland. First, we have Adam Bennett, who's responsible for recovering SNX891, the Oxford truck, from uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ocean. And he made it uh, roadworthy once again for our second guest, Mr. Tim Slesser. And he is one of the six members of the first Overland. So those those interviews are coming up later in the show. Uh, this is a long show, as you've probably already noticed, dear listener. We enjoy talking with both of those gentlemen. We you know, we let them talk. Special thanks to our monthly Patreon subscribers. Your support really does help the show. Uh, go out to patreon.com slash center steer for all the details. Thanks to my mother, who is now a Patreon subscriber. So thanks, Mom. Also, thanks for your comments, follows, likes on the Facebooks, the Twitters, the Instagrams, the emails. In particular, we received an email from a friend of the show, Martin Port who is the art editor of Classic and Sport Car Magazine. And you may recall he has he also rescued the uh, Trans-Africa truck. He emailed to explain the difference between uh, HUE-166 and JUE-477. So here's what he had to say. HUE-166 is the first pre-production Land Rover. There were 48 pre-pro Land Rovers made from another two chassis built allegedly. And UE is the first of the pre-pros. JUE-477 is chassis number 860001, 8 standing for 1948, and 6 standing for Rover. That means that it is the first production Land Rover following the pre-pros. Mike Bishop's is one of the pre-production vehicles. Of course, as we know, Land Rovers weren't built sequentially, and so it's possible or probable that JUE 477 was built while the pre-production vehicles were still being assembled, Either way, HUE-166 is older than JUE-477. The recent announcement uh, by Jaguar Land Rover resolves around them restoring pre-production vehicle number 7. Again, that is older than JUE-477, but is, by default, one of the 48 pre-production vehicles rather than Land Rover chassis number 1, as can be claimed by JUE. I hope this makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. So I think... Yeah. That helps clarify mm-hmm. that we had. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And uh, listener David Short, who conveniently is listening in on the show, so I'm going to read his email on show number 58. He thinks you uh, we read a news article that mentioned a motor power using the abbreviation of PS, and you guys did not know what it stood for. It is a German acronym. See Wikipedia. DIN 70020 is often abbreviated as PS, derived from the German word uh, for horsepower. All right, Mike, you got to say the word. I'm glad you're here, actually. You can say the German. Is it? I can say the German word? Why? I'm, I'm sorry, I meant David. Did I say? No. I was going to say, German always sounds so good with a southern accent. Yeah, and a British bent and a southern accent. <laughs> no. Uh, I, I believe it's Ferdestarka. Ferdestarka. That's it. Starka. That's what Steika. That's what it looks like. DIN HP is measured at the engine's output shaft, usually expressed in metric horsepower rather than mechanical horsepower. So you think that's what Harold stumbled across uh, around the answer, but it is a bit more, but there it is a bit more clearly. In German, P-F-E-R-D is, how do you say that? Ferda. Ferda is horse. Horse. And Straka is strength? Straka. Strength, yeah. So it's horse strength. Germans love to put words together to make bigger words. And then you also noted that Nigel, who took the uh, Disco 5 uh, to the Vermont Land Rover Experience, and I liked your comment here that the Disco 5, you said, had more off-road capability than it needed. And then you said, doesn't that make sense? Uh, that Doesn't that make sense when it is speculated that the new Defender will show the platform as an, exist, as an existing model? 
So I assume you think that the Disco 5 might be that ch that uh, chassis, right? Yeah, I mean, who am I to know? But I mean, the Disco 1 and the Defenders from the 1993-94 time period shared an enormous amount of parts. Why wouldn't the Disco 5 and the new Defender share a lot of parts? I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And I'm happy to hear that Nigel thought it had a lot of off-road capability. That's actually encouraging that the Defender won't be a... Uh, you know, a lady's handbag. Absolutely. I, I think you're right. And it would make sense that they've been testing things in, in, a, in a real world, real world means for the Defender, I think. Yeah. And also a listener, Aaron Scott, sent us a link to the brand new uh, Bronco that's supposed to come out in 2020. The Ford Bronco is uh, going to apparently uh, come out and there's a first look, although the first look is really it's just a, a, a vehicle with a tarp draped over it. But we'll have a link in the show notes to Autoblog and you can take a look at that. Yeah, if that interests you, because that'll be a that's going to be a competitor to the new Defender. However, it's likely to be one of the first Ford SUVs in a while that hasn't looked just like its Land Rover counterpart. And it, it will be interesting because the Bronco was actually brought over to the UK by Land Rover as sort of a vehicle to pick over and look at what they were competing with when they were designing and building the Range Rover Classic, or the Range Rover at the time. And before we get to our interviews, we have two event previews. Uh, first up, we're going to hear from David Short. That's why he joined us on the show to talk about Rovers at Wintergreen. Joining us now from Virginia is David Short of the Rover Owners of Virginia, known as Rove. And they have an upcoming event. He's going to give us a preview. It is Raw Rovers at Wintergreen. Welcome, David. Hey, welcome, guys. Thanks very much. Actually, welcome back. You have been on the show before. Yeah, it's been a while, but yeah, I'm, th I'm happy to be back. Thanks, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome. So tell us about Raw. Um, so Raw, the, the Rover Owners Association of Virginia holds two major events each year. The first one is Rovers at Wintergreen. The second one is the Mid-Atlantic Rally. The Rovers at Wintergreen, or Raw, is an event we hold at the uh, Wintergreen Ski Resort. Usually the ski resort closes in early spring, and then we come in right after that. And we have access to some uh, trails uh, in the woods and across the ski slopes. Uh, it's a lot of fun. We uh, it's, a, it's a nice event because for this event, this Land Rover event, we are able to take advantage of some great off-roading trails, plus have the full features and benefits of the resort, the spa, the pool, the things for the uh, the hotel, the nice warm showers. Uh, we have a nice dinner at the, uh, at the uh, resort as well. So it's a, it's a great... Uh, more civilized adventure than, like, say, Mar, which is more camping in the mud type of thing. So it's kind of the yin and yang of our events for each year. But that's uh, it's coming up this year, April 6th through 8th, 2018, at uh, Wintergreen, Virginia. Is there, is there any snow left by then, or is it going to be gone? The resort normally opens the resort to the Land Rovers once the snow is gone. Okay. This year's weather, <laughs> oh, my God, you can't predict anything. So I think they had uh, about 12 inches last week with that big nor'easter. Uh, I think they're supposed to get one or two inches the other day with a little light dusting. The weather keeps going up and warm and down and cold. So I don't know, man. <laughs> uh, in years past, we've uh, we've had a dozer cut the snow across the ski slope so we can go across with the trucks, which has been kind of fun. Other years, it's been just straight sunshine and grass. So who who knows what we'll see. So, so just like any other Rove event, come prepared for anything. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, and there is camping also in addition to cabins. No, this is all. This is all. The resort wants us to stay in the resort facility, so it's all hotel and lodging, the condos at the ski resort. So uh, they gave us a special rate for that. Uh, so they want to keep everyone in the in the own the properties. One of the one of the conditions of us using the property is us getting people in their hotels. And uh, since this is coming out right before the event, is, is there still availability to stay in the resort, or do they would folks have to go uh, further afield? No, this is it's great because this the resort. The ski season's over with when we come on, so we we fill a big open void for them. So there's plenty of availability at the resort. I mean, we practically run the place that weekend, nice. which is great fun. Uh, and so yeah, lots of space, lots of availability, and registration on site, so it's okay. Perfect. And how much is registration? Uh, it be well, we're past the early bird registration benefits. So if you come, if you did the early bird registration, <laughs> it was ninety five dollars, but uh, it's be one hundred twenty dollars on site, uh, and that gets you your dinner and uh, and raffle tickets and on site registration as well. Nice. And what are the, how many trails and what are they like? Like what kind of uh, levels of trails? Ah, oh, geez, I should have known the exactly numbers, but uh, oh, hey, um, yeah. I bet there's better than twelve to sixteen different trails. Oh, that's good. And there's uh. There's some trails that are very scenic, Shimokan Falls. It's very nice. The water cascades over the rocks. There's also Slip and Slide, which you can <laughs> – yeah, I almost went sideways, upside down last week. We are doing a little work weekend. So that that one's a little uh, – yes, yeah, so we got all levels, uh, all levels. Uh, we got one that's straight down. A lad took his D2 on it a couple years back. 
didn't understand the high range, low range thing about the gearbox and using engine braking, but he rode the brakes the whole way down until about halfway through and his brakes boiled and he lost all brakes. Yeah, so we've got really steep, really rocky, really exciting stuff. We've got plenty of scenic stuff down fire roads and grassy ridge trail to overlook the uh, ski resort. So it's kind of a mix of everything. We try to keep a good mix going. Uh, but if you want to you want to test the, I mean, because it's a ski slope, it's got altitude. So it's got, you know, so that's, uh, it's got some interesting downhill, uphill type of arrangements. Oh, cool. of course it would. I just thought of that. As soon as you said ski slope, it didn't dawn on me until just a moment. Yeah, you're going right. to get some nice steep inclines to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's mostly, mostly all in the woods. Uh, uh, we try to get off the slopes as much as possible to keep those protected, uh, but mostly in the woods and uh, rocks and trees and, you know, typical Virginia Land Rover event, rocks and trees and, and steeps and muds. And mud nice. and mud and mud. <laughs> a, little bit. a little bit. That is your state crop, is it not? Um, no, not exactly. Leave that for another time. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about Mar this year, too. What's coming up on, on Mar? That's usually in October. Mar's going to be the first week in October. I think it's October 5th weekend, uh, that day. A lot of stuff in the hopper trying to get planned. I don't have a lot of stuff nailed down quite yet. This is the 70th anniversary of Land Rover, so we're really excited. I'm uh, um, I'm talking to a bunch of folks. I'm, I'm I don't want to let thing out of the bag yet, but I got a bunch of big plans. Hopefully, one of the big plans will actually come to fruition, um, and uh, we'll get some uh, some folks there. And it, it, I mean, it's put a lot of effort into it. Hopefully, it's going to be a good time. And uh, last year, we had sunshine for the entire Mid Atlantic Rally. Wow, that's, you had what? That's you had what? <laughs> yeah, here's the. This is no fooling. Uh, I actually had to go out and lease. A water truck. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, that's hard to believe. I had to lease a water truck at the last minute to come in and wet the road down in and out of the campground because there's oh. so much dust wow. Uh, wow. kicked up by the trucks. Wow. And wow. Inconceivable. That, yeah, yeah years past, we would lease amphibious landing craft to yes. get in and out of the campground. That, uh, that so yeah, no last year, so I don't know what the raw is going to hold this year. We had a dry mar last year. I don't know what the mar, bar is going to hold this year. So it's a... Weather, it's always exciting, adds a lot of excitement to the adventure, yeah. Indeed it does, indeed it does. When does registration open for MAR in October? Generally, uh, in the August time frame, uh, we got to get raw put together, got to get summer t- uh, put behind us, and get, uh, so about the August time frame. If you got to, maybe we should uh, try to make a, a podcast venture and visit MAR for the first time in a long time and bring the podcast yeah. down, especially since it's 70th anniversary. Yeah, I haven't been in a number of years, it might be fun. Yeah, where and um, where is Mar this year? We, we've got a, a new permanent home, as much as permanent can be, uh, down at it's called Wheatland Farm. It's in Giles County, Virginia, which is down near Virginia Tech, near Blacksburg. So it's kind of a trip for you guys in Pittsburgh and for you guys in the Great New England area. You got to get on your horse and get moving. Uh, well, it's, but it's, yeah, it's um it's down in southwestern Virginia, it's and it's a in a nice farm. It's actually in the shadow of uh, Mountain Lake Resort, which is where they filmed Dirty Dancing. Ooh. Huh. There you go. Gotcha. Yeah, that's <laughs> absolutely. That'll get Johnny's juices going. Yeah, yeah, of course it would. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but, sure. but I mean, it's it, does, it doesn't sound any farther away than Pearl's Pond was for us. Yeah. Um, it's about another two hours, maybe. Oh, hour and really? Two, hour, two hours by rover speed. Yeah, it was about six hours to get to Pearl's Pond and, and those areas, the you know the James River area. Right. Uh, so it's, you said it's a little further. Well, we'll look it up and, and find out, but definitely can, can make a try. Back to RAW, which I've noticed, by the way, you, you tried MAR and RAW are backwards. They're acronyms. They're almost backwards. You just invert, almost. Invert, the, almost. invert the M and the W there, just throwing that out. You, you caught that, didn't you? <laughs> I did. I did. I caught that. Uh, so uh, RAW is coming up, and uh, you're also going to plan, I think, a, another RAW for next year also for 2019, correct? Correct. Yeah, um, it, we're pretty excited. This year so far, the pre-registration numbers for Mar, for RAW have been outstanding. We've surpassed last year's total attendance already with pre-registration, which oh, is nice. exciting. And what were those uh, numbers? It's been a little bit too exciting because I'm kind of worried about space and the space we've rented at the moment, <laughs> uh, the, the, the seats and dinner tables and all that. But we, we'll work through that problem. I already talked to the resort about that. Um, but, yeah, so we're looking to stay at the resort. We've got a lot of room to grow there, and the event's growing. Uh, it's grown every year, and it's a, it's a lot of excitement to come, to come down there. Wonderful. Well, hopefully some of our listeners uh, show up at, at Raw and maybe and maybe even at Mar. When you see David, if you're a listener of the show, make sure you ask him to mime for you because he has a really good facial expressions. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> David, thanks very much for coming on the show and, t- and giving us a preview of your events coming up this year for Rove. Uh, let folks know where they can find all the information on your events. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, so the website, roav.org. That's the Roadrunner Association of Virginia.org. That's our website. All of our events for the whole year are posted up there. 
and uh, registration links are there as well. You can get to our store and everything there. So it's all your information is right there. You can also check us out on Facebook if you want. And Facebook is the same website, I assume, or same acronym, ROAV? Yep, that, that's right, ROAV. Thank you again, David. See you on the trail. All right, looking forward to it, guys. Thank you very much. Also coming up is the Sand Rover Rally, which we had uh, had him on the show, I guess it was about a year ago. Morgan is going to give us a remind us about that that event. Yeah, I think, uh, what was it? Mike Ragsdale was on the show. I think it was episode 48. And David, you were on the show, I think, episode 37 last time. Um, so, you know, any listener who wants to go back, check those out. Great interviews. Uh, Sand Rover Rally is actually the same weekend. It's a free event in... Oh, man, I'm blanking out. It's uh, South Walton, Florida. It's the Um, Panhandle, Florida. Yep. So it's the Friday, Saturday, so the 6th and 7th. So if you can't make it up to Virginia for uh, the RAW event, you can always head down there to the Sand Sand Rover Rally. Actually, it's the 30A Sand Rover Rally. Or if you want to do a whole lot of driving and and, uh, bomb through, you could make half of each. (laughs) That is a lot of driving, but you could do it. And now, the news. So first up in the news, uh, we we will talk about, as we do, uh, JLR sales. Uh, They achieved in the United States. Is this the United States, Mike? As I look at this, maybe this Uh, is... Since I can't see what you're looking at, I'll I'll just say yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking at your story. Uh, (laughs) Sure, let's go with that. So JLR JLR achieved second highest February sales. I believe this is actually worldwide. Retail sales of uh, 39,911 Jaguars and Land Rovers in February. That was down 2.6% from the previous year. Which was also which was an all time high. China demand was up three point three percent. Other overseas markets were up one point five. Uh, the UK was down fifteen point two percent for the month. Europe was down six point nine, and North America was down two point two. Uh, again for the for the month this is February was down. So with the company's sales up two point nine in January, year to date sales are level with a year ago. So. It sounds good, but, you know, kind of stable, I guess. Quickly regarding the UK numbers being down so much, is that partially because in the UK their diesel sales are such a high percentage of their market sales and they've been having some issues related to diesel over there lately? Yeah, the, the, their reports really didn't break it up by, by vehicle type, so you couldn't see whether it was diesel or, or whatever. You know, some people have said it's due to Brexit fear. Some people have said it's due yeah. to... Whoever knows what. The real key that I picked up is is how big and increasing the market China is. I mean, that just increasingly drives their market and where they really look. So, and they so have, true. And they've built special vehicles just for that market also. You know, exactly. Jaguar, both Jaguar and Land Rover built special vehicles for them. Uh, yeah, which proves your point, Mike. And thanks for continuing to put that information out there so we don't have to go find it. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> then, moving on, uh, JLR to invest £4.3 billion on new products, technologies, and facilities in 2018. Ralph Spaeth, the uh, CEO of JLR, uh, said investment is intended to match JLR's manufacturing and technology prowess with that of its rivals, such as Audi, BMW, and Mercedes. Uh, so they, I guess they're you know, pushing on that 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 uh, luxury th- you know luxury push that they seem to have been making last year. Uh, we already know that the JLR has uh, th- that plant in Slovakia, and that's supposed to open or commence operations by the end of calendar year 2018. So that's part of I, I think part of this uh, investment that they're making. Next up is a bit of rumors. This is the rumor mill from uh, Land Rover Owner International magazine changes at the top at Land Rover. I'm going to read a good portion of this because I think you know it's interesting. At the Geneva Motor Show, uh, members of the motoring media were wondering whether Jaguar Land Rover was also heading for a slippery slope. This followed the relocation of the company stand into a desolate corner next to t- owners Tata Motors and a lackluster press conference debuting the Range Rover SV Coupe and the Jaguar i electric car. I love the words that they put in here, the you know lackluster and desolate corner. The event was previewed uh, by the surprise announcement that Felix Brom Brautigam, we should get our German speaker. How, how do I say Brautigam? B-R-A-U-T-I-G-A-M. He's miming again. Is he? Okay. <laughs> he's miming. <laughs> he's miming. He's, he's, 
He's speaking my German. in ASL. <laughs> He's, no, that would be a G G S L German sign language. Felix would become the chief marketing officer, effectively absorbing the responsibilities of Andy Goss, a name I can say, who, who as sales operations director, had been presiding over a rapid rise in Jaguar and Land Rover demand. Goss, who will be leaving to pursue new challenges in the automotive business, shorthand for not wanting to stick around in the new organization. Anyone wondering why JLR event seemed too downbeat was given another reason for the gloom when just over a week later, it was reported that Special Vehicle Operations MD, I guess Managing Director, John Edwards, was also on his way to be replaced by Michael Avendersade, joining the company from the Renault Sports Car Division Alpine. Edwards' departure, this was the Special Vehicle Operations Manager, uh, marks another step in the demise of former Rover Group and Land Rover staff to be replaced by by European Carmen. Brottigam is German and Vendersled is Dutch and poses the question as to who might be next. There are fears it could be Land Rover's chief design officer, Jerry McGovern. Yeah, he won that prestigious award. Insiders also report that his ambitious design themes for the brand are being tamed by more cautious members of the board. His proposals for the Discovery and Discovery Sport were rumored to be much more radical than the designs that eventually went into production, while the motoring press certainly expected something more of the Range Rover SV Coupe. What's getting my attention, what's what's on my, what I'm thinking here is this kind of gives Brexit a whole new meaning all the british people are leaving the company and the europeans are coming in that's that's an interesting point that kind of confuses all of that yeah yeah but when you consider that the jlr is an indian company they don't have that british mindset from the top down anymore so what i took what i see in this is you know again this is all you know suspect and rumor Assuming it to be some truth, there's people laying the groundwork here that if, I think, if the Defender comes out and it's not, doesn't sell well, or there's a general downturn in Land Rover sales, they're going to turn around and blame Jerry. Yeah, well, obviously, plus the fact that if Jerry is winning awards and doing well, he could move to a bigger company. Uh, Yeah, there is some speculation he could start his own design company and and leave. Yeah. Yeah. And the other side of it, you know, not knowing what's happening inside the black box (laughs) is these are probably people that Jerry has been working frequently with. And it's possible that maybe they're leaving, not necessarily because of Jerry, but to be replaced with people who might work better with Jerry, just to, you know, toss the other side of that coin. Well, but if the board is uh, allegedly, the board is resisting some of the things that McGovern is doing. That doesn't seem to support that case. Seems like they might be bringing in people purposely to a little better manage and control uh, what what McGovern's trying to do. It's yeah. certainly possible. Yeah, it's it's fodder for the podcast, though, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> the current sales figure is notwithstanding. It seems a little strange to me that they'd have that much of a house cleaning when when the the product has been gaining ground for for month upon month upon month. Oh, years even, actually. The last several years well, very good. Yeah. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's what I'm saying is that it's, it's been going in the right direction all, well, until recently. But now all of a sudden, I mean, is it that, you know, that short news, like we just had a bad month, now they're going to clean house because of it? Or, or is this something else? As I recall, it's been several months now. Didn't they not change their uh, marketing, outside marketing help? And they yes, had, a, they, they, had a, they yeah. like, yeah, so it's, yep. and then now the, and then the marketing guy is gone or is being moved, moved around. So maybe that's related. Maybe there was some sort of house cleaning underway. And, uh, these are changes that were, this is just a, the finally seeing some of the things as, as, uh, Morgan said from the inside the, I'm going to say the black doors, cause it sounds much more appropriate to the black box. Well, the inter- uh, really the interesting thing to me of those was those Michael Edwards leaving because he was more of a technical guy him over the SV operations you know he's not the marketing and the sales and the whatever he's 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 a true motor guy and him leaving shows some sign of of what the thinking is to me and his name John Edwards by the way oh yeah sorry Michael Edwards was years ago yeah valid point yeah and you know obviously somebody who has run the Alpine division they have some technical experience as well. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what that change might bring to SVO since they are trying both to produce the modern vehicles, some of the one-off vehicles and do, you know, the, the classic restorations Mm -hmm. all at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, if we get, you know, SVO gave us the 
Discovery SVX, right? I don't know. The, Jerry's still got to be working pretty closely with them. Now, I don't think this necessarily has to all be about Jerry either. It could be some other no, things. No, no. And, and I don't think so either. Uh, but it, it has been interesting seeing Jerry say numerous times in the past that, you know, he doesn't want anybody producing third party modifications for the newer vehicles he want he really wants svo to do all of those vehicle modifications because they want it he wants the money right keep the money in house well i mean it could also have to do with something we talked about earlier with with the chinese market if these guys know how to approach that market you know they may be looking at we need to hit that one even harder. So maybe they're looking for other areas of expertise. I haven't followed some of the other European manufacturers, but we also have a whole lot of, you know, driverless vehicle stuff coming up. Mm -hmm. Land Rover is certainly working on and working with other European companies to produce that technology and, and advance it. So there might be something in that area too. And as I think of this more, this is probably come, this would probably come from Spath himself as the CEO of JLR. I suspect these are the you know, it's all under his control and management. These may be things that he's he's been pushing, assuming this you know these things the way they say it are true, or it could just be maybe natural turnover. Something happened in somebody's life and they moved on. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, yeah, right. there could be nothing behind it. Well, why don't we move on to something less controversial? The new Defender. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Did you like that? Did you like that? There you go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so I just did. That might just be a show title. And now for something less controversial. <laughs> JLR Designer says new Defender will shade the G Class. I That's pretty much the headline, is all you really need to know. Land Rover's head of design in its advanced research studio, so this is not McGovern, was asked about the future has in store for the new Defender. Richard Woolley said that while the new Defender version will stay true to the principles that made the classic model a success. Quote, it will be, has to be, a different kind of vehicle, unquote. And then he goes on to say, <laughs> and then he goes on to say, he's confident the new Defender has what it takes from a design point of view to, quote, push the G-Class in the shade, unquote. I just like the quote. Now, of course, with this whole thing, first, do you want to say the actual name of the G-Class? Glendenwagen. Uh, no, Glendenwagen. Ah, oh, I get it wrong. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to make you Thank you. Glund say another German word. Glendenwagen. John, John, John mispronounced something? Imagine that. <laughs> Glendenwagen. Hey, he's been getting my name right for at least a year now. That's so right, That's right, Larry. Good. That's right, Larry. Without a post-it as well. Yeah. Um, Where did the post-it go? So uh, one of the things that's very interesting about this, beyond trying to make John pronounce the name, is I want to know which G-Class he was actually referring to. Oh, John found the post-it. I found the post-it. We still have it after 60, <laughs> 60 uh, five years of the show. I still have the, the post-it I would put on the computer to remember Morgan's name. Well, thank you. I'm glad it's still there. Gladenwagen? Uh, nope. Glandenwagen. Glanden. Glandenwagen. You're close. close enough. You guys are not helping. Um, Continue. <laughs> so obviously the G class, or the, yeah, the G class is the G wagon, and that's really the only other vehicle out there that is as close to the original Defender as possible. And it's still being produced. It's only been in production for about 35 years, though, unlike the the Defender, which was much longer. Of course, Mercedes does have the Unimog, which has been produced longer, I think, than the than the Defender ever was. But and the, and that's something that's actually capable of throwing shade on on the Defender. So true. And honestly, I think even the G Wagon was capable of throwing shade on the Defender. In some ways, yeah, yeah. I think it in was. In some ways, the G wagon or the G class was actually supposed to be replaced somewhere around 2004, 2006. I can't remember uh, by the GL class, which is much more like the newer Land Rover vehicles that they are all unibody and everything. That would be a so, horrible thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's I'm, it's I mean, been out, but it just obviously doesn't really compete. It's it's a luxury Mercedes SUV. I'm sure they're fairly capable, but probably not as capable as and the Land Rovers. 
And it ain't no G-Wagon either. It is not a G-Wagon at all. So, you know, it's interesting to hear them toss around things like that because it, it starts to sound preposterous. <laughs> I mean, you know, the thing about the G-Wagon, you say it's it's true to the, the concept of the Defender, but it's also true to itself because it really hasn't changed much in those 35 years. Really? Definitely. They, they got it right, so there was no need to fix it. Yeah. And, of course, here we are. We were kind of wishing that they still had the Defender because it kind of felt like they— Got it fairly right. Not entirely. I, I think it's interesting if I can jump in, guys. The the G Wagon is targeted at a certain target audience. I mean the the well heeled sort. The Defender we had hoped would be more of a disco sport type of entry level mid market type of vehicle. If they're going to start duking it out at the G Wagon market clientele, that's that's going to push it way up there in the price and way up there in the clientele. Not for you know people like me. Yeah, that's um, true. They're good. That. Yeah, they certainly have in the past discussed it as being that intro model. But if they are competing with the G wagon, that's that puts it up at the top of the line. Well, if you well, look the, at the rest, the, of... the G wagon was available in a in a somewhat stripped down version because they sold a ton of them to the police and military. But it could be done. That's what I'm saying. And if you look at what Land Rover has done in the last several years, they do have that entry level model. But then they also come out with special models that they start pushing you uh, up upscale, uh, you know, up the up the list, and then they'll add things on. Yes, they'll have the new Discovery Five, which is fifty thousand dollars. But if you want the one that has all the cool stuff on it then you're going to spend probably sixty, seventy-five thousand dollars on it. So I think the same thing will happen with the uh, all car companies do this. They all have this entry level price point and it's usually one car and it's you know it's stripped down or has bare bones stuff that they have to have on it and they make three of them. And then oh you want the one that has all the cool stuff that we talk about on TV and in the ads? Well, you know, we made a bunch of those and they're you know then they're this much money. So I think that's yeah. little same thing will happen here with the Defender. Uh, unless you're like Porsche and you have the base model has all the bells and whistles and and you know if you want like the special version that has all that stuff removed to make it lighter that costs you more money. Mm. Anyway, right. <laughs> yes, I don't think Land Rover is going to go that approach, but yeah, that's L- let's that hope not. Yeah, exactly. And, and another comment too, which you had made, uh, David, was Mercedes has much deeper pockets than Land Rover does, so they can keep the. The the G wagon uh, rolling as long as they want to because they you know they, I don't think they particularly care that it's if it's a money you know, if it's losing money or they that they have to invest a bunch of money into it to bring it up to modern standards because they can afford it yeah plus and, it and, makes sure that their people don't leave their market if somebody who wants that type of vehicle who's a Mercedes person they don't go get in a Land Rover and then go oh wait a second this Land Rover is nice maybe I should look at a Range Rover or maybe I should look at a Jaguar it keeps their customer their customer yeah. right and it's it's like a halo car for them in that exactly. regard too and it's actually not produced by Mercedes themselves so that also helps that oh, really? you know I, I didn't, unlike I, the Defender. That's interesting. I didn't was. know. That. It's made by Steyr. Is it? People, make, people who feeling? brought you the Pinsgauer. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, and of course. And, and, and the Halflinger, if you really want to get nerdy about it. But. <laughs> and of course, they do have, you know, the extremely modified special versions like the 6x6 six six that they sell in mostly in the Middle East and, and such. Mm-hmm. So why don't we move on? Uh, Richard Spaeth, who, of course, is the CEO of. Uh, uh, JLR talked about diesels and electrification, and we're going to focus on the diesel thing though because I think it's interesting. He said uh, with the increased demands of electrification, cleaner petrol and diesel engines, the company will be compelled to invest more in cleaner technologies, which is likely to affect margins and profitability. Specifically asked on the future of diesel, and the article here from India uh, said, "Is it really a bad guy?" He Spath said. One of the companies recently announced that they are getting out of diesel, which, uh, spoiler, that's Fiat Chrysler. Uh, it will be a pity to marginalize diesel. Diesel will play a key role in the future. We also should know that nobody can change over the weekend. Electrification, hybridization, and battery electric vehicles will play a very important role in the future as this is a step into new sustainability, sustainable mobility. Sorry put those words together. However, the internal combustion engines, are, too, are getting real high tech. Sounds like he's putting a stake in the ground saying that, yes, we're going to we're going to use all available powertrains as you should. Yeah. Use, I, what, I, use what you have until the new stuff is is good enough to replace it. Yeah. And I think it's good that Land Rover in general has sort of stuck to their guns about that. They're clearly trying to remind everybody 
the reality of the situation. Kind of get ahead of the ne- the next article is it, and we can talk about these together. It, Fiat Chrysler is the uh, latest uh, is your latest automaker to turn its back on diesel powered engines. FCA, which manufactures Jeep, Dodge, Ram, Chrysler, Maserati, Alfa Romeo, and Fiat, will unveil a four year plan to phase out diesel vehicles on June first. The Times said a spokesman declined to comment. So it looks like they're it's not official, but it looks like they're discussing the possibility of uh, phasing out diesel engines, which is interesting because they just start touting Jeeps here in the United States having diesel engines, and everybody was excited. Well, but if it's a four-year plan, it's not like they're just overnight stopping. And and four-year plans have a way of turning into five-year plans. Yeah, and, and it'll be interesting to see what happens in the market that might change that plan down the road. Right. Yeah, if those diesel Jeeps don't sell. Right. Or, or what if they well, do? Right. If they do sell. Or if they do, yeah. yeah. Or <laughs> yeah. if they do, oh, wait. You've got to consider also the, the, the quarter, three-quarter ton, one-ton Ram trucks with the Cummins. Uh, I think that would be the last thing they would get rid of. Yeah. Maybe part of the plan I, will be they, they get out of it for passenger and passenger style vehicles. They might stay in it for the commercial, uh, stay in it for commercial purposes. Oh, I say, or they get out of it and say, oh, but Cummins supplies the engine. So that's not really us in the business. Yeah, there you go. Right. That, that very well could be the case. And, you know, along those lines with, with Cummins producing the, uh, uh, what's their new drop-in crate engine? Oh yeah, that thing's nice. Um, uh, yeah, it is. I've looked at that. That's yeah, it's very I, cool. <laughs> I've looked at that too, um, and that is actually not to get too far off the subject, but that is uh, EPA certified for I think up to 1999 vehicles in the U.S. And it's 50 but, state as well, right? 50 state mm-hmm. for up to 1999. Some of the states are through like 2000, 2001. Yeah, it's not it, the best option for a Land Rover, but but it could be done. And it's it, it's just a really interesting, you know, the power output for the size and the fact that it's a turnkey kit in a crate is, is really cool. Yeah, it exactly. is, yeah, it's very cool. And that certainly seems to be selling well from what I'm seeing. I haven't seen any full numbers, though. Seems to be well received and quite popular, understandably so. Since they actually went through the work to get that EPA certified 50 state, they can continue to do that for other engines. And it's very likely that they can start taking over more markets in terms of smaller vehicles, because traditionally Cummins engines have been difficult to fit into smaller vehicles. And so now right. if you're producing a crate engine, that's an easier option. Yeah. So if a company like Fiat comes along and says, no, we're not going to do this ourselves. Oh, sorry. Can you guys hear my ha- cat hollering? What's your cat's name? Uh, <laughs> yeah, but but like exactly. So that you, you can tick a, a mark on the order block for a sp- for your special order, oh, that it goes to their, quote, special vehicle operations and has a Cummins crate dumped in it. Yep. Right. So there may be more options coming that, you know, get us around that. And certainly it's nice that Cummins themselves have decided that this is a market that they want to go after and will support. Well, as we all know, I mean, everybody likes to do these these projects and do custom stuff and, and modify things. And they've recognized that, you know, there's a big market out there and they're going after it. You know, for those in international markets and overlanding, Cummins are very common engines to find around the world. So it's it's a really good solution for those kinds of setups. Well, and it's a company that knows how to make engines that last a long time. It makes nine grand for the crate kit. Seem downright affordable yeah in terms of you know bang for the buck and and the power output is is phenomenal for vehicles the size we're talking about finally in the news uh so i may not sound like it but there wasn't a lot of uh, land rover related news this month but uh, there were two reviews of new land rovers that's to bring your attention to if they interest you a range rover velar at uh, fifty thousand dollars american the roadshow which is a cnet uh, venture um or magazine i guess uh they Test drove a four-cylinder turbocharged four-wheel drive of Velar. It was uh, got 23 miles per gallon. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but if it interests you, go out and check it out. They really like the vehicles, kind of like the short version. Uh, I'll read you their good, bad, and bottom line here. Arguably the most stylish SUV in the market today. The 2018 Velar is also one of the most well-rounded models in the market with ample power, peerless cabin, surprising off-road chops, much improved tech, and the Velar makes cool Britannia a thing all over again. The bad, the Velar can 
can get very expensive very quickly thanks to a long list of desirable options. Its new infotainment system is much improved, but still not class-leading and still doesn't offer Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. Bottom line, not just one of the best new vehicles to be seen this year. The Land Rover Velar is also one of the best to drive. Good to hear. Mm -hmm. Overall. Yeah. 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 Maybe I, we know, uh, as uh, you may he learn soon or possibly, you never know, uh, you might see one at some off-road event that you go to. <laughs> Shh, quiet. Don't say anything. Uh, next, Jalopnik reporter was invited along to a Land Rover experience trip to Peru in a Discovery 5. Just go check the article. I would recommend you going to check out the article just to see the pictures because there's some really, really neat, neat pictures. And it's a nice, nice article uh, about it. So that apparently a bunch of people around the world won Land Rover experience trips, this trip to, to uh, Peru, and uh, Andrew Collins got to go along uh, with it, and uh, there were 20 Discovery uh, Fives in the in their fleet, and he, you know, talks about the vehicle, you can read about it, and I'm trying to find the things I wanted to mention here, here we go. Tragically, the today's fifth-gen Discovery has been stripped of such distinctiveness as a result of Land Rover's quest to appeal to the masses, the current disc disco can be mistaken for any other SUV. That's why if you want people to know you're on an adventure, you've got to strap the thing up with a roof rack and a few pounds of decals. I thought that was cool. That sounds good, yeah. Yeah, it seems about right. And get it dirty. I think I would, I would add get it dirty. Yeah. And then uh, I think this is the final thing to mention here uh, from this article was uh, running aggressive Goodyear all-terrain tires, the SUV. The SUVs were nothing but common codes and easy to drive. While my and I really like this line. I'm, I'm reading this article just for this line. While my old Discovery One would huff and puff up hills and list around corners like an old pirate ship, <laughs> this new one just glides. Today's Discoveries may not be all that full of character, but is most definitely as competent and counts for a lot when you want to drive off the edge of the map without getting uncomfortable. Gonna say that listing around like a drunken elephant is just part of the, the Land Rover experience, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, really. <laughs> but what is you know, it, it is interesting what you said about the mud, though. I was flipping through a Discovery 5 brochure, if you can call it that. It's more of a book. It's huge. I was looking through it yesterday. And then I started to look through it, and I could not find one single picture in there with it dirty. There was not, you know, like the old Defender and everything else. You know, there were pictures of them going through mud and doing things for important people. But there was there was not one single sort of off-road, dirty, muddy, or whatever type picture in that entire book. Yeah, that's just not right. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It, it, it felt. It just felt wrong. The new Land Rover. <laughs> I mean, you, you got to show pictures of them filthy just to prove that they can. Exactly. In many ways, they look better filthy. Right? And certainly the old ones look better filthy and bashed up. His description of a Disco 1 as an old pirate ship uh, going around a corner, it, it just... it. It's true, though. It, it evo you, when you hear that those words, it makes sense, especially if you've ever driven one or been in one. You're like, yeah, exactly. That's absolutely correct. It's exactly. And what while it you're is. driving, you usually say "arg." Yes. <laughs> Throw out the, the anchor. The, the HMS Jim Bob. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's the news. Let's move on with the rest of the show. And now on the Center Steer Podcast, it's time for our special guests for the fifth anniversary of the Center Steer Podcast. We talked with Adam Bennett over Skype from York, England. Now, the audio is going to sile on or skip at times. It's well worth it. It's a, it's a great interview. He's fantastic. Uh, Adam provides a thorough and detailed accounting of locating, recovering, and restoring the Oxford truck. You want to check out his Facebook page. Join it. Uh, it's Legend SNX891 of First Overland. And, of course, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Now, this is part Part one, next month, we're going to have part two, where we talk about the rest of his collection and other activities that he is up to with Land Rovers. And now listen in and find out why we're calling this man the world's most confident man. In honor of our fifth anniversary, the 60th show of the Center Steer podcast, we have a very special guest with us today, all the way from Yorkshire, is Adam Bennett. Well, yeah. Wonderful. Welcome, Adam. Adam, you are a special individual because you have retrieved the Oxford truck that went on the first overland all the way from Ascension Island and, re and repatriated it back to the United Kingdom. So you are you're held in high esteem, especially on this show. So welcome to the show. Thank you. How did it start? Where how'd you find the truck? We, that's that's what we really want to know is uh, is how'd you find the truck and how did you get it back and what challenges did you uh, did you face? How much time have you got? We'll take as long as we need. Okay. How big's the hard drive? We can stuff it full. 
Okay, well let, let's uh, let's start. So I guess I started uh, collecting Land Rovers and, and owning Land Rovers when I was about fourteen. Uh, my dad got me a, a Series Two truck, and then that progressed over the years, and I ended up with Range Rover Classics, and that rolled into uh, Land Rover Discoveries, and then we went back on to Range Rovers again, and eventually we went on to Jaguars, and then the uh, the Land Rover thing came to a stop, and then. About two, 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 let me think, no, about three and a half years ago, one of my clients that I, I deal with at work, he announced what we'd all heard, that Land Rovers were going to stop making the Defender and that this was going to be uh, real big news because uh, you could still buy them, you could still order them, and uh, and it was last, last chance, and he was going to carpet bag some, and he was going to make a fortune doing this. So he went on so long about doing this that I thought I'd go and uh, buy a 90. So like you do, I goes and buys a 90. That's a 15 plate, 15 year model. The 90 was very nice. And then the 90 leads into a 110, which leads into another 110. And then what happened next was we went to see the last 110 being manufactured at the factory at Solihull. So we went on a factory tour to see the car getting built. Uh, that was the beginning of uh, 2016. Uh, it was then the last run of vehicles. And while we was at Solihull, they've got like a, a showroom for one vehicle where they do personal handovers, where they do the meet and greet. And in the showroom, they've got straight from the outback, uh, Series 1 Land Rover, 80-inch, uh, I believe it was, or it could have been an 86 thinking about it. But it's what they call Car, car Zero. It was the first car uh, that they brought back to the factory for the reborn program. So uh, I've caught them out. They were doing this for some photography. They weren't expecting anyone to see it. They weren't expecting anyone to ask them about it. I caught them red-handed and said, come on, I'm a good customer. You've got to let me know what this is all about. So uh, they let me into the secret. I said, I'd like to buy one. They said, oh, it doesn't work like that. So I said, well, how does it work? You know, I'm a customer. So sure enough, they agreed <laughs> to sell me one. So what happened next was the salesman came to see me. We did a deal. I bought a car. And as things work out, I ended up with car number three. But things didn't work out. And uh, and that's another story. Uh, however, while we were in the process of talking about them finding me a car and what kind of a car did I want, what was my wish list for a, for a Series 1. Uh, I said I'd like to have a UK car, preferably over an Australian car, something with some history. I like Australian cars, but it's just done one thing all its life. It's lived on a farm, and apart from being immaculate, no rust, you know, it's got no real story to tell. So the guys at Land Rover Classic said, if you can find a car... We, we can put it through the program for you, and then uh, and then you can have sort of the car of your dream. So the, we start rolling down the process, and finding cars of dreams are very, very difficult. However, uh, I created a short list, a bucket list of cars that were out there uh, that are known about, but they're not in anyone's collection. I made a short list of about, three, four, five vehicles, and in no particular order of which one that I wanted to get the most, uh, there was Oxford, SNX 891, Cambridge, uh, SNX 761, uh, uh, and then the Dewey car, the first production series one, uh, to be sold. Uh, so that's the kind of list. So that gives you an idea of what I was looking for. So, of course, these things... You start off and you think this is going to be, oh, this is going to be easy. You know, what happened to this Cambridge car? The Cambridge car's gone off a ravine near the border in Iran. This is easy. We just go to Iran and we go find the car. And I think this is going to be easy. And then I find out that the Jew car, J-U-E registration for the first production car, uh, chassis number one, that's in a farm. And the farm is... Uh, probably about two hours away from where I live. So guess what? That's going to be really easy. It's two hours away. And I even know the guy's name and I know where he lives. That's going to be easy. <laughs> and this car, this car on this little island somewhere, and at that time I wasn't sure whether it was Ascension, 
I wasn't sure whether it was St Helena. I just knew it was on an island somewhere. I thought, this is going to be really tough. These other ones are going to be easier to do. So I started the process, uh, and what I did was I decided to go down the track of not trying to find one and failing, but trying to find them all at the same time so that if I spent a year finding one and I couldn't do it, then I wasn't going to spend a second year and then a third year. So I tracked off all these cars, and I was looking at other cars, but that's by the by. They they just didn't come to... There were nothing that exciting. So I was tracking these three cars, and, of course, the car that appeared on face value to be the most difficult turned out to be the easiest. So what happened was... I've got a Land Rover 86-inch Easy on, which you may or may never have seen before. But basically, Land Rover, uh, or the Rover company, when they first started building Land Rovers, they got involved with a company that was building the hydraulics, the hydraulic optional extras for the vehicle, uh, like wind shears and all this kind of equipment. And these people were supplying them with all sorts of things. And this company, one of the things that this company did was they made uh, what they called uh, low clearance or ground clearance uh, hydraulic trailers. So if you've got a load uh, and you need to winch it on a trailer and you need the trailer bed to be flat to the floor, these trailers sink flat to the floor. So the people that manufacture these trailers came up with this idea. We're doing this work on this new Land Rover with these people. We do this, they do that. How about chopping a Land Rover in half, a brand new one, and welding a trailer on the back of it. And what they did at that point in time was uh, they created probably the front-wheel drive Land Rover because the rear wheel was no longer driven. So the car was permanently in diff lock. uh, So it was front-wheel drive only. They certainly created the first... uh, rise and fall suspension on a Land Rover because the, the rear suspension's hydraulic. So you get this very unusual vehicle. So I managed to, uh, this vehicle came up on eBay. Uh, I took one look at it and I thought, I've got to buy this thing. Uh, it was reasonably priced. The vehicle came along. I started work restoring it. And it's very interesting. It's very special. Uh, it's something that we're working on. We've been working on it for a couple of years nearly now. So through owning this easy on, uh, a chap contacted me via the uh, Land Rover Series 1 Owners Club called Peter. Uh, I'm severely dyslexic, so I don't read magazines. I don't get magazines. I don't. I never. I look at the pictures. I never read the words. So I didn't know that the chap that had contacted me was a chap called Peter Galilee, who was a writer for the LRO magazine. I hadn't realised that. And I didn't realise that. He sent me a message saying, I'm really interested in easy ons. Uh, I've never seen one before in all the years that I've been researching Land Rovers. Can I come and have a look? And I said to my wife, this guy wants to come and look at my old Land Rover. How about that? Peter came over. We became friends. Uh, he saw what I was doing. And it's a big challenge It's because it's not just a Land Rover. It's something really big. Uh, and then I asked him about the cars, and he knew of all three cars that I was tracking, all three cars that I was looking for. He'd wrote articles on all three cars, and he was absolutely amazed when I said to him, uh, do you know anything about these cars? And he said, well, I've wrote articles on them all. So he forwarded me the articles that he'd wrote on the cars, which got me up to a lot more speed on all three of the cars. From that, I decided that, oh, before he said that, I was already tracking the cars. Uh, So what I'd done is I'd, I found out that the car was Oxford was uh, had been abandoned on St Helena. Uh, I had heard the stories that it had been turned into a hen house and things like this. From that, let me think what happened next. I contacted the St Helenian government. I put in a request under freedom of information for the registration details. Uh, they came back to me, and I'm. I'm a, quite a, a lucky kind of person. The chap on St Helena, not that it did me any favours, but he was also a Mr Bennett like me. It was quite amusing that there was emails going backwards and forwards and requests to different departments from Mr Bennett for information required by Mr Bennett. Anyway, they came back and they said, we don't have records. And the truth of the matter is, I think on St Helena, it's such a small island, 
there's so few vehicles that they basically give you a number that you paint on the car. There is no paperwork because everybody knows who everybody is. But if the car's off the road and no one knows, well, there we go. So what I decided to do was I decided that I would place an advert in the uh, St. Helenian newspaper. They have two weekly newspapers. I was going to place an advert in there, full page for a month initially to start with, which would have said something on the lines of, uh, oh, Land Rover's wanted, do you have a one, do you have any parts? And then put a picture of a derelict Land Rover, not the car I was looking for, because I thought that was too too much to the point, but something very similar, derelict. What happened next was I agreed with the newspaper, everything was organised. I am so optimistic uh, that I'd even contacted the shipping company that works on uh, on the island, and they're the people that ship on, ship off. I contacted them, and I said, can you tell me what means are there for taking things off the island, like a vehicle or vehicle spares? And they said, well, it's by container, and we're the only people that do this kind of work. So once we'd said this to the, once we'd said how it works and things like that, I then went on to say to them, tell me, how many cars get exported off the island? And there was this deadly pause and this, no cars ever leave the island. So what about car parts? Nothing ever leaves the island. So can you tell me, uh, has anybody ever exported anything? And it was like, no, she said, nothing, nothing. The only thing that leaves this island, if a contractor comes and he brings a new vehicle and he wants to take it back with him after his contract, that leaves the island. Nothing else leaves the island. So I said, great stuff. How much is a container? She said what the quote was for a container. I said, when's the next voyage? She said, it's in however many weeks' time. I said, I'd like to book a container. At this time, I didn't even know if the car existed, and I'm already booking the container. I then got a la one of my members of staff, and I said to him, what are you doing, uh, what are you doing next week? So he said, well, I I'm at work. I said, well, that's good. I said, uh, can you go and do a little job for me? So he said, yeah, anything you want me to do. Yeah, of course I can. I said, I need you to drive down to RAF Bryce Norton, and I need you to get on a, a transport plane, and I need you to fly down to Ascension, and then I need you to, uh, from there, I need you to go and get uh, uh, this this book called the uh, St. Helena, and that will, uh, RMS uh, St. Helena, and that will take you to this island, and I need you to go to this island. So he said, uh, what do you want me to do that for? I said, I want you to look for this Land Rover for me. So he said, well, why won't you go? So I said, well, it's hard getting on the island, but you're going to be there for maybe three weeks or maybe a month or maybe a couple of months. And, and I don't really want to be there that long. So so he scratched his head a bit and he said, I can't do it next week. But if you're serious and you want me to go, I'll go in two weeks' time. So I thought, perfect. We've got a man willing to go. This is great. So in the meantime, uh, Peter Galilee realised that I was serious, absolutely serious. He realised that if he... He obviously knew the concepts because he'd run stories on it. He knew that I was going to do these things and he knew it was going to happen. So I guess he realised that it was just silly not to sort of tell me that actually he knew exactly where the car was and he knew the person that I needed to speak to. And he would ask the person if it was OK to hand the number over. He contacted the chap. It seemed like it was for years. But the chap he contacted was a, a gentleman called Bruce Salt, who's a lifelong Land Rover enthusiast. Uh, he lives on St. Helena. Uh, he's the guy you go to see if you need some parts for your Land Rover. He's the guy you need to go and see if you need something hauling. He's the man on the island. Land Rover, he's the person. So uh, it seemed like ages, but it was probably an hour before he, <laughs> before he replied and said, uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and the story basically goes, I sent him an email saying, I don't know where to start. However... I understand you know where the car is on the island. I understand you know the owner. I booked a container. Uh, the container's coming in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, can you uh, can you hook me up? And the this really genuine reply came back, and he said, "Yeah, he said I'll uh, I'll have a ride out and see the owner and uh, and, uh, and and see how how it lies." And then the next day, he came back by email and said, "I've been to see the owner." And it was a really good meeting. I found him on uh, in really good form, and uh, it's prepared to do something. Uh, 
I said, fantastic. Uh, how much does he want? I'll, I'll send him some money now. So he said, oh, no, 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 no money. Uh, you can be a millionaire on this island, but it doesn't, you can't buy anything. So people need things on this island. So I said, well, what, 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 what does he need? So he said, uh, he wants a 90. <laughs> so beginning of the story, I said that I'd bought a 15, year 15 model night. So we're back to there. So I've got a nearly brand new 90 sat on the drive, like two years old. So I said, this is easy. I've got one on the drive now. I'll send him my 90. So he said, it's too new. So I said, I'm offering him a brand new car. It's got 3,000 miles on the clock. What's the problem with this? He said, we can't service the Puma engine. We've got no diagnostics on the island. We can only cope with 300 TDIs. He wants a 300 TDI. I thought, this is getting even easier. There's 300, must be millions of 300 TDIs. So the next day I went to buy a, a 300 TDI, being optimistic like I am. I rang the, uh, the, 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 the shipping people again, and I booked in uh, a 300 TDI to be shipped with them uh, on the next possible shipment, which was in about 14 days' time or something like that. Without, uh, without, without, or without having a truck to put on the ship, right? Yeah, yeah, with not knowing anything. I'm already booking the, uh, the, 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 without, I, yeah, I haven't bought a truck and, and, and I haven't secured the deal for definite, but I'm sort of thinking this is going to happen. So let's just roll with it. Go, man, so, go. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, so I started, I had to book them in a registration number. So I found a car and I give them the number. It turned out it was not very good. We didn't buy that one. But what we did do is I had to employ people to look for a 20-year-old Land Rover. You would not believe how hard it is to find a 20-year-old good quality because it had to be good quality. I'm sending something 6,000 mile away on a ship where it's costing me thousands of pounds to ship this thing over, and I don't want it getting rejected when it goes there. And if, if you're doing a deal with somebody, you want them to receive it, be happy with what they're receiving, and know that you know you you're a man of your word. You're sending them something good. So what happened next was we found a car. It was a lot of money. It was a total rebuild in light green on a galvanized chassis. A few little jobs needed doing. We bought the car. We did the jobs, and and by this time, just to throw into the mix of all the madness, uh, Tim Slesser, uh and I at this stage I hadn't read First Overland. I just I'd seen the film, but I'd on YouTube, but I hadn't read the book or anything. Next thing, I'm in contact with Tim Slesser. Next thing, Tim Slesser's jumping on the train from London, <laughs> and now he's in York, and we've got this new light green 20-year-old 90, so Tim can look it over. And I got some great photographs of Tim with the car, and I shipped over, I, I, well, I didn't ship over, I emailed over video footage of the car, of doing a walk around, and I emailed over photographs of Tim Slasser with a car. I emailed photographs of the paperwork so these people could tell this is, you know, this is really happening. So what happened next was, so now I'm friends with Tim Slasser. You have a now I'm you've... friends with Bruce Saul. And what else is happening? Let me fast. So then the deal comes, okay? The reason he's held on to Oxford for all these years, this is the first story. The reason he's held on to Oxford for all these years is we're back to the beginning of the story where we said that you can't buy anything. No matter how much money you've got on that island, you cannot buy anything. So if you're running a Land Rover and you've got a series, whatever you've got, you will want to keep any of the Land Rovers you've got just in case you only need one minor component that breaks that stops the truck from running. So people keep hold of their old Land Rovers. So this guy had three Series 1s and he had a Series 2. So the deal was, the deal was simple. You send me a 90 that's in good serviceable order, and I'll, you can have all my old Land Rover collection. And then I needed the collection because we've gone back to this idea where Damn. parts interchange between vehicles because they don't have parts. Parts from Oxford had gone on to the, uh, his other Series 1. Parts from his second Series 1 had gone on to his Series 2. So all these bits have been merged together. That was sort of the idea. People had been asking this chap for years to sell him or give him or let him have souvenirs of Oxford. And it turned out that he'd known 
all the time what the vehicle was. And the truth behind the story was that his wife's uncle was a water bowser driver on Ascension. And his job, one of his jobs was, uh, he worked for the wireless and cable company who was based on Ascension. And uh, Malvin March, who was the current owner's wife's uncle, worked on Ascension. Uh, he worked there in the 50s. He retired in 1977. And he used to deliver the water to the camp of the second expedition, the bird watching expedition on Ascension, the, where the car lived. Uh, now, people, people have think that there are stories and it might be right or it may not be right, but we've actually managed to find now a photograph of Malvin March stood on the back of his water bowser delivering water to the campsite of the second expedition where Oxford lived back in the late 50s. So when the bird watching expedition folded and they uh, basically contacted Land Rover and said, we're finished with the truck. What do you want to do with the truck? Land Rover said, scrap it. Give it to anybody that's been useful to you. Donate it. Give it. We don't want it back. So what happened next was, so when the uh, the second expedition, when they closed down, basically Land Rover said they didn't want the vehicle back. They made a mistake because I suppose they didn't make a mistake. They've got millions of Land Rovers. What's one old Land Rover? But what they didn't know is they didn't know how good a condition it was still in. We've since got colour photographs of the, of the truck, uh, more or less how it was left when it was gifted to Malvin March and the truck was in good shape, we've managed to come across colour photographs of the vehicle. The vehicle's parked on the runway on Ascension, and there's some, uh, there's some bombers landing in the background, and they're on the, they're on the airstrip picking up some provisions, and it was a really good truck. He must have been absolutely ecstatic that they'd given him this truck. And as well as giving him the truck, they said to him, this is a really special vehicle, and this is a copy of First Overland. And they gave him a copy. So he knew exactly from day one what the vehicle was. What happened next was he retired in 77. By this time, Oxford was no longer on the road. We think that it had a catastrophic engine failure due to internal corrosion uh, inside the cylinders and probably the block had become porous. We know that because we've got the original cylinder head and we're running on the original cylinder head but it's very, very badly internally corroded. It's on its last life. There's not much left, but it's good apart from that. It's just badly corroded. Uh, so the car was off the road, but this man's retiring, and he's taking his own car, which is an 88, and he's taking Oxford, the 86, and he's taking them both back home with him to St. Helena as part of his uh, retirement package. This is his truck he's using, the 88, and this is the car is using for bits to keep it alive. So this is Malvin March. So Malvin March ships the cars, uh, and he ships them to. We know the we know this happened because uh, he had to go to the police station and he had to get authorization to be able to tow these vehicles from uh, the dock back to his homestead. He got a tow rope. He fastened the two vehicles together, and the eighty eight dragged Oxford round St. Helena up the side of a mountain where the current owner was dragged. Was, he was the man being towed in it and the turret was cut and the vehicle three-wheeled down a side of a mountain, extremely steep, to its final resting place where it never moved again. And that was in 1977. So the vehicle never moved again. By this time, somewhere back on Ascension, the hardtop had been transferred and what happened is, we don't know exactly when, but we do know on Ascension, Oxford managed to, it looks like it's rolled down a hill. And it had some damage on the passenger side rear corner. That had to, the back corner was badly smashed into the wheel. They'd removed the hard top and the rear door to try and straighten out the damage. They straightened out the damage, but they couldn't get the hard top back on again. And they couldn't get the door to fit back on again. So they transferred the hard top 
and the rear door onto the ATA because that's got a straight body. And, you know, we've gone back with this idea that nobody wears anything and they're certainly not going to waste a hard top with glass in it and certainly not at the rear door because they're valuable. So then Oxford had the tailgate, the drop-down tailgate transferred onto it and the hood sticks off the ATA because we're not throwing those away. So that's how the parts got interchanged and swapped. The car lives on the hillside, and the uh, the gentleman uh, is uh, the gentleman owns them by now is Malvin March. Malvin March uh, dies, unfortunately, and he leaves his homestead and all his shackles, worldly shackles, and vehicles, everything, uh, to his niece Gloria. Gloria is married to a chap called Eric, and now this is the chap that I'm doing the deal with to get the remains back. Eric had been sort of nattered for years by people, and it's hard to believe that, you know, everyone in the UK was looking at this thing thinking, including probably Land Rover, that this thing is safe to leave there. There's no hurry to pick it up. Uh, nothing, it's always going to be there. But the truth behind the matter is that when I started my research, there'd been a programme in place to make an artificial reef around the island, and they'd been using old wrecks depolluting them and putting them in the sea. Loads and loads of quality old cars went into the sea. So there was a chance that I had been chasing something that was gone, and it could have gone. And also, the new runway had been built, and a massive area was cleared for that. So there could have been this idea that the car didn't even exist. So we were really lucky to find the car. The other good news is that if the car had been left behind on Ascension, on Ascension, they've got a policy of tidying up. So any wreck on Ascension was pushed into the sea. Absolutely anything. So there is no scrap vehicles there. Everything is scrapped. Now they've stopped putting things in the sea because of marine pollution. Now it goes on to landfill. And what they do on the landfill is they burn it out and they run a bulldozer over it and they push it into the ground. So if it stayed behind on there, it would have been destroyed. So it was just... Fate, all the way along, this car has had good luck and fate. You know, the hard top could have been lost. The rear door could have been lost. The car could have been left behind. So good good luck and fate all the way along. The cars end up there. The cars are now owned by this chap called Eric. His surname is Leo, so it's Eric Leo. And Eric's now driving around in this series too because finally the 88 with a hard top on finally probably in the early 90s, the bulkhead corrodes, the firewall corrodes so badly that the car becomes uh, no longer usable. And also the oil consumption on the engine was so heavy, the vehicle was using more, more oil than it was using petrol. Now, he keeps all the cars, as we've discussed, but now he's down to his last Land Rover. He's down to his Series 2. And this Series 2 is very corroded. It's got all sorts of problems. It needs a lot of time and money spending on it. And none of the bits he's got on any of the old Series 1s are going to save this car. Uh, it's just not going to happen. So what happened next was we found the owner of the car in a good mood because he'd realised that now was the time to do a trade with somebody. Uh, can, I, can I pause you to ask, was it in fact a chicken coop at one point? No, that it's funny how stories and things carry on. It had never been a chicken, uh, a chicken coop. What it actually been is it turned it into his chemical store his chemicals for his small hole and his poisons so he'd had his chemicals and his uh maybe his creosote and all his nasty chemicals to poison the rats with so it was his chemical store it had never been a chicken coop there'd been a story some time ago and it was a romantic story but we can bust those myths uh, because i found most of the answer it had been a store but for chemicals and for things that he wanted sort of out of the way of people to keep it dry to give it some shelter, there might have been a story kicking about that it swap it that it was a, that he would swap it for a chicken coop. But this is one of these fables and stories that have been kicked about, and I don't know for certain if this is true. But it never actually been a chicken coop. What had happened was moving back from the purchase of the remains and how the vehicle had become remains was as follows. Oxford had lived where it had been towed, so the rope had been cut. It rolled down the mountainside to its final resting place. Uh, from its final resting place, it did never moved. However, this isn't land that is owned by Uri Cleo. This is the, the highway, but it's not really a highway. It's a track, a dirt track, 
uh, on the side of a mountain, extremely steep, passable for one car only. So he's got it on the dirt on the side of the track. Uh, the highway people come and they say, uh, we are resurfacing the road. We're going to make it safer. Uh, you need to move all your scrap from the side of the road. So he looks at his scrap and he thinks, I've got, I've got this car here. What can I do? It sat on the floor because he's used the wheels and tires off it. It sat on the floor. How do I move it? You can see that he started to try and undo the nuts and bolts. He has attempted to do it. He's tried to undo a few, maybe on the rear tub. He'd gone to the rear tub, and where the rear tub's bolted to the chassis, he's managed to undo one nut and bolt. And then you can see this has taken him a long time to do, and he's worked out that this is going to take forever. And he's got to move this thing now, because the highway people want to come through, and they want to put this new road through. So what he does next is he gets himself a grinder. I'm presuming by the looks of things, it was either a 12-inch still saw uh, or a 9-inch electric grinder, we're not quite sure, with a steel cutting disc on, and he dismembers Oxford as she stands where she lies. And he gets the grinder, and he's clever because at the back of his mind, these bits are still usable, tradable, saleable, so he doesn't want to wreck any of these bits. So he gets the grinder and he makes chops through the rear tabs that hold the rear body to the rear cross member. So because that's the first one he's tried to undo and he's failed on it. He then manages to take the rear body uh, and he manages to dislocate the rear body from the rest of the vehicle. And he lifts it and he moves it onto land where he's allowed to store things. And he puts the rear body on his own land just to the side of it on four concrete blocks. He then takes his grinder and he dissects. So he then lifts off everything he can lift off. So he lifts off the front wings, lifts off the bonnet, lifts everything off that will come off easy. And what he's left with next is a chassis, which is almost perfect to the point where you would cry if you knew how good it had been. And two axles, an engine and a gearbox. He then takes the grinder and cuts through the front and rear prop shaft in the middle of the prop shafts. Cuts through the gear stick. Oh. Not, the, not the stick itself, but the bracket that goes from the gear stick to the gearbox. Cuts through the bracket, takes the bracket off, saves the bracket, cuts through the prop shafts, straight through them, lifts the gearbox out, and puts the gearbox in the back of the tub. Then he gets his grinder, and he cuts through again the tabs that come down from the chassis where the shackles go into for the rear spring hangers. So he cuts through the chassis so the rear axle drops out with bits of chassis tab still attached, still attached to the leaf springs. He then gets the grinder again and he cuts through the U-bolts that hold the springs to the axle. Now, this sounds bad, but this is really good because in putting this back together, we can line up every single cut we know we've got the original back axle, the original front axle, because the nuts have never been undone and they're absolutely jam solid. He's then flat packed the full car into the rear body. He's left with the chassis. Unfortunately, the chassis gets bulldozed off the side of the mountain to make way for the new road and covered with earth and an engine block goes over and various other bits go over and presumably lost. So what happens next? Uh, he tarpaulins it up, sheets it all up, and then really all these things that he's saved are useless to him because what bits can you really take off a Series 1 and make fit onto a Series 2? And anyway, he's got this 88, which is easier to get bits off. So really, and he's got another Series 1. He owns the first uh, Series 1 that was sent to the island uh, which was a knockdown kit that was shipped to South Africa, and that was the first Land Rover police car on St. Helena. So he's got he's got lots of Land Rovers. So this thing sits under the sheet. He knows that there's history behind it. Uh, he hangs on to it, and then along the way, people come and steal a few bits and, 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 and take a few bits, and a few bits maybe get traded, a few bits get lost. One interesting thing was that the second expedition to Ascension, the birdwatching expedition, the chap that headed that expedition was uh, uh, Dr. Bernard Stonehouse. Unfortunately, he had died. His son had been tracking down Oxford because it was his dad's car. 
his dad was a famous explorer. Look him up on the internet, Dr. Bernard Stonehouse. This man was a serious explorer, very, very interesting man. Some of the things that he'd done were absolutely amazing. The late Dr. Burnhouse's son had looked up the car and he tried to track the car down. He was in the Royal Navy and he'd been flying to the Falkland Islands and they'd had a stopover to refuel on Ascension and he tried to get access to leave the RAF base to go and check out his dad's old base camp and the military wouldn't let him out of the off, off the air base because obviously people go off the air base, they don't come back in time and then what happens to the flight? So he wasn't allowed to leave, which was annoying for him because he was ne that near to his dad's base camp. When his dad was still alive, he'd been researching Oxford and he'd got as far as finding Eric Cleo's phone number. He called Eric Cleo on the phone, something that I'd, you know, something nobody ever, anybody else had never done. He'd called him up on the phone and said, I understand you've got my dad's old car. Uh, what's it like? I I'd love to get the car back. I'd love to know about the car. So what happened was, Eric Cleo, instead of saying, yeah, it's great, I've got it all here, said, the car's scrap, which <clears throat> oh. he, gave up with, he oh. gave up with the idea that the car was scrap. He said, could you send me a souvenir? He said, sure. He said, well, how about the, uh, the VIN plate off the firewall? And he said, yeah, that's fine. So Eric Cleo unscrewed the VIN plate off Oxford, put it in an envelope, and sent it to the UK in the post which is still safe in the man's hands. We're currently running on a reproduction one, but it's in safe hands. One day he may give me, or we might trade, or, but it's in safe hands, and, and, and that's good. It was safe one way or another. We know where it is. It's safe and sound. He gave up the idea of doing anything with the car because the owner told him it was scrap metal, there was nothing left, which was good for me and bad for him because obviously it wasn't too bad, or in my opinion, it wasn't too bad. So what happened next was... Going forward into time, we've now got this 90-inch, uh, uh, light green 90-inch station wagon, and we've got the thing checked over by Tim Slesser. Uh, we've got the thing uh, booked in for the, uh, the, the the ferry. Well, it's not a ferry. It's a roll-on, roll-off. It's uh, going on a, a Royal Navy roll-on, roll-off ferry from Portsmouth, what, or Southampton, actually, from Southampton or Portsmouth, one or the other. It doesn't really matter. So my guy drives the car down. He gets a plane and flies back to Yorkshire. I pick him up from the airfield. The car goes on the ship. And then we've got this situation where I've agreed that they will have the car before we get the other car back because they don't know me. And it's sort of like, you know, I could be kidding them. I could not be the person that I appear to be. What happened next was very interesting, that the paperwork came through to say that the car was on the ship. I sent, uh, I sent Bruce the paperwork, who was acting as my agent, uh, the middleman, the saviour of the vehicle, really. I sent him the paperwork saying that the replacement 90 was now on the ship, and he went to the, the owner and said, great news, this is the ship's manifesto, your 90 is on its way. And, and the owner of the vehicle, Eric Leo, after a little bit of thinking, just said, this is going to be fine. Start dismantling it, start packing it. I trust this man. Just do it. So this is starting to look good now because uh, we've got a container on Hyatt. We've got a container book. You wouldn't believe how this thing worked is that anything that could sort of go wrong did go wrong. But then it was just all the way along. Something was just helping it. Something was just every problem that came forward. It was remedied and rectified. So what happened next was there was a problem with containers. The shipping company said, we're worried about you having a container, putting old car parts in might get contaminated with oil and we'll never be able to use it again. So I said to them, how much is a container? They said, oh, uh, about 1,500. So I said, I'll buy the container. Don't worry about oil in the container. I'll buy the container. So they said, we don't own the container. We leased them. So then I found that you could go onto the internet and if you have got the container number, you can check up who owns the container. I rang the container company up and I said, Hello there. Uh, I'd like to speak to somebody about buying containers. So they quickly put me through to a department who obviously are used to selling thousands to customers. And here's this eccentric Yorkshireman wanting to buy one. Now, the good news was that the containers were on hire and the containers were on hire. And when they come to end of life, they have to be returned to their home port, which is London Docks, which means that if 
St Helena can't get a return <coughs> for the container, then they have to pay to send an empty container back to London, which is big money. They're trying to sell them. They're trying to do something with them. So the deal was done, and I bought the container. The story behind the container, there was so much paperwork with the container and getting released onto the container that Bruce Salt, who is an ex-policeman, Bruce Salt went to the uh, the dockyard, which is a very small dockyard, and more or less stole a container. It's not really stealing a <laughs> container, because on St. Helena you can't steal anything because it's so small. And everybody knows everybody. But the red tape was getting silly, so he went down, found a shipping container, put it on a truck, took it back to his yard, and put it in his yard. And before anyone could say, no, you can't do that, I said, well, it's happened, and I'll just give you the money for the container. And I'm paying you to bring it back to London. So everyone's happy again from being sad. Everyone's happy again. Then the fun comes because he needs to lift the container off the truck. The crane breaks. So this great big massive crane to lift the container off the trailer into his yard, the container, the, 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 the crane break. So he has to then mend, Bruce Salt has to help mend the crane just to unload the container. This is a, this seems ridiculous. But everything along the way was like, no, it's going <coughs> to not. And then the next thing, it'd be, Phew, uh, everything's OK again. So the container gets filled. Bruce starts this dismantling of the 88. And I said to him, what's happening? What, what are you dismantling the 88 to get it in the container? I said, no, 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 no. I said, just push it all in and just strap it all down. Don't dismantle anything. Just get it all, push it all in. So Bruce started work bringing the things down from the mountainside photographing things and doing all the things that he could do and getting all these things organized. At the same time I'm working on, because I'm working always a long time in front of whatever's happening now, has sort of happened, been planned a long time in advance. So by now I'm ordering chassis. I'm organizing, ordering the wiring loom. I'm organizing and ordering everything required to rebuild this truck because I know that it takes months to get these things. So I'm full time now working on ordering parts. It then becomes very apparent that I need the old chassis, the chassis that's been bulldozed off the side of the mountain. Even if the chassis is rotten, I need the chassis just so the authorities can look at the chassis and agree that I've got the original chassis. And the other thing uh, one of my friends advised me was if you leave that chassis behind and even if you don't need it, somebody else scrapes it up and collects it, they could they could claim the title to the vehicle. So you've got to have the chassis. We went back uh, to Bruce and I said, I need this chassis. So he said, well, it's gone off the mountain. I said, I'll send a man on an aeroplane with a metal detector. We will find this chassis. So he said, I'll, I'll speak to Eric. I'll speak to Eric, he said. He went to Eric and he said, Eric, this might be a, this might be a, a deal breaker. Adam needs the chassis. So, uh, it, you know, he really needs it. it it's, he's got to have it. it it alters it from being car parts to being a vehicle when it's rebuilt. It needs to be able to prove title. So what happened next was Eric's a wonderful pe person, just like all the rest of the St. Helenians. Eric went and sharpened himself a machete. I went down the side of the mountain with a machete, started chopping the undergrowth down, got himself uh, some kind of a, a small spade, fork, and probing the ground to find where the solid rusty chassis was. He found it, he uncovered it, and then the next thing I get a phone call from Bruce, which is not a Skype call, a phone call, ecstatically from Bruce, I don't know what state it's in, not sure whether you're going to be happy, but guess what? We've found your chassis, so you've got a chassis. We've even found an old rusted engine block, so we've got these bits for you. And the chassis was rotten, and the unfortunate thing was that when he chopped up the car, he dismembered the car by grinder, death by grinder. He chopped off the steering relay and he'd cut the chassis. So he'd cut through the front dumb iron, he'd cut through the front cross member and through the chassis leg, and he'd removed a section of the chassis with the steering relay in, still connected to all the arms, undone the nuts where necessary. And we'd got this section, when it came back to the UK, We've got a section of chassis, and we know what the chassis was like when he pushed it off the side of the mountain, and it was like new. And what's happened is the chassis's gone into the undergrowth with soil pushed on top. It's so humid, and all the little creepy uh, insects and all the bugs and all the grass getting into it, 
It's just decayed the chassis. When they first uncovered the chassis, it looked really good. It looked salvageable. The the, uh, the climate had denatured the metal and it set up a, a non-recoverable kind of reaction where as it dried out, it became flaky and flaky. We've got the chassis. We've still got the shipping container. So what we've done is we've retained all the things like the chassis and the shipping container. And there is sections of the chassis that you could do something with. You might be able to do something with. And there is parts of the original bulkhead that you could do something with. So we haven't thrown anything away. Everything that's been removed has been saved, even down to the last nut and bolt, even down to U-bolts that were cut cut off to when the axle was taken off the springs. We've saved everything in the container so that you can always go back and reassess what's going on, reassess what you might be able to put back on the vehicle. For instance, the damaged rear wing. Uh, We've got the damaged rear wing. It's wrinkly. If we can find somebody with enough skills or a big enough press to press the rear wing, we'd put the rear wing back on because then the patina would match the car and it's going to look good. But right now, I can't find the person with the skills to do it. Uh, Bruce is working like mad. He's working like mad filling the container at his house. And then I hit him with a bombshell, which is I just looked at the dates and I realised that we could drag this thing forward a full month. And I realised that if he sort of pulled off a miracle and sort of worked really hard, by Friday, you know, let's say we're on the Wednesday, by Friday, if he got everything in the container and he could get the crane working again and could could do these things that sound easy over here, uh, that we could get it to the docks and we'd be a month early. Anyway, Bruce did it. He pulled the miracle off. He was launching things in the container, got the door sealed up, checked the paperwork with the customs people, got it onto a truck, got it down to the docks. The next thing, the container's on the RMS centre laner, and then we're on maritime tracking, and we can see this thing coming back to the UK. What we didn't realise at that time was that if he hadn't put his foot on the gas and picked up the pace of this job, and if he'd let it just go on to the next one, which we could have done, what would have happened then is the RMS St. Helena uh, developed a serious problem uh, with uh, propellers and rudders, and the ship became very intermittent and went into dry docks, so it missed two voyages. So that meant if we hadn't have got it when we did get it, it'd have been another two months, and then who knows how what a backlog of containers and things. So it was good luck again. So we tracked the, we tracked the container ship, uh, we'd do screenshots of it, it was shipped to Cape Town, and from Cape Town it changed ships, uh, and then it was heading to Gibraltar. In the meantime, the 90 is on its way down still. The 90 gets unloaded at Ascension off the uh, the MOD roll-on, roll-off. Because we'd moved forward onto a journey, and the other car, because the original idea was that we'd pass over where we'd hand up our container with the 90 would land, the container with Oxford would go. But we've sort of brought this forward. The next thing that happened was the RMS St. Helena uh, developed problems. So the chap, Eric Leo, a lovely man, and his wife, Gloria, their replacement vehicle was now on stuck on ascension with the ship broken. So he had to then use his son's Pajaro, which was okay for a short period of time. And he still had his Series 2, because we, we did a survey of the Series 2, and we worked out that there wasn't a great deal on the Series 2 that could have been off the 88 or off Oxford. We worked out the very most there might be some gearbox components. What we decided, or what I decided was that I would leave uh, the Series 2 on St. Helena. The reason being, I would need another container. And if a container's £5,000, to bring back a car that's worth 1000 and it costs 5000 it's minus 4000 So what we did was, I donated uh, the car to Bruce. He donated the car to his mechanic. And the mechanic, as part of the deal, I removed the gearbox and any other little bits that I needed and put them on a pallet so that in future, if I ever want to pull that gearbox back, not that it's the right one, but it is part of the deal that's come with these cars. I've still got a few things to bring back. So that's what happened to the Series 2. Eventually, the RMS uh, St. Helena got back on track and eventually the man got his 90. He's highly delighted he's got his 90. He's so happy. It's unbelievable because this car's in the Heritage green colour 
that the last of the uh, the nineties and the one tens were put into, and it looks like one of those. It looks absolutely tremendous. And this is a poor. This is just a poor two poor people, and all of a sudden, from driving around in this wreck series two wreck, they've now got this new truck with alloy wheels and beautiful paintwork, and it's a safari with rear seats. It's beautiful. <laughs> So he's the envy of everyone on the island, and and people stop and turn around and look as he drives past. (laughs) The good thing was, uh, well, not the good thing, but the funny thing was, on St. Helena, everybody gets a nickname. Everybody, no matter who you are. And if they say they haven't got one, it's just that they haven't found out what people call them. But everybody's got (laughs) an also known as nickname. And everything gets named. So the 90 ain't called the 90. The 90 gets renamed Adam. Uh Uh-oh. (laughs) <laughs> so now nice. there's a car driving around 6,000 mile away from home that's called Adam, which I it, it was good. It was a nice, it was a nice, and and you know this isn't wasn't a joke. You know, let's go get Adam out of the garage. So I've had a car named after me now, which was really really good. That's cool. So that's tied up at that end. There's nothing much more of that story to tell. So now where we are, we've got Oxford in the container with the 88, and it's heading uh, north. And it's left Cape Town. It's heading for Gibraltar. We track it to Gibraltar. It leaves Gibraltar. And then it goes round and it goes to Rotterdam. And then from Rotterdam, it goes to uh, London Docks. And then from London Docks, it goes on a train to Leeds, which is large for UK towns, a town or a city that's not too far, about 20 miles away from where I live. Part of the deal of bringing the container back to my home, which I paid for them to do, they send the container on a flatbed, and the flatbed's got two two cranes on the side, and the two cranes grab the container and just do that and basically put it down where you need it. So now we've got the shipping container with all the goodies inside, and then it's a case to, uh, once it's on the ground and it's on UK soil, and we're still keeping this thing reasonably secret because we don't need people knowing where it is, and we don't want people hassling us and... And in the meantime, because of what Peter Galilee had done for me from the LRO, I'd agreed that he could run an exclusive on it because he had followed it for years. He'd put a tremendous amount of effort into trying to raise the profile of the car to try and get somebody to do something with the car. Peter, you know, asked if he could do a story. I said, yeah, that's what I can, you know, the least I can do for what you've done is you put me in touch with Bruce. And what happens next is we arrange to meet up with Tim because Tim's in a mad rush to see his old car. Uh, I bet. We get a crew of people together. I ring a friend of mine and I say, I'd said to him that I had something cuppy, something happening. You know, I've, I've got something ongoing and and I'll tell you about it nearer the time when I can tell you. And I rang this friend up of mine uh, that's a Land Rover enthusiast and I said to him, would you like to come down? And he said, uh, yeah. Uh, he's cut this chap's called Robert Sargent. He's a massive Land Rover enthusiast. He said, what are you doing? So I said, well, it's sort of a need-to-know basis, but you may as well know. I've got Oxford in the shipping container at my house, and I wondered if uh, I've got Tim Slesser coming down, and uh, we're going to unload the thing, and I wondered if you wanted to come down and unload it. And he's sort of like, you've got what in a container? You know, because I hadn't told anyone, not even my friends. I just kept the thing quiet while I did it. So he said, you've got what? So we opened the container just before Tim was coming, we went in because Bruce had filled the container. It filled, it sent me a load of gearboxes and differentials that were off later vehicles uh, that he wanted to send into Ashbridge transmission, Ashcroft transmission for refurbishment. Opening the container doors for Tim would have been ridiculous because it was that full. You couldn't get in there. So we opened the containers up just before Tim came. We took out the things that were non appropriate like gearboxes and differentials from 90s and 110s and put them outside so you could physically get in. We got a sweeping brush and had a bit of a tidy up and made the thing look a little bit more presentable so that you could physically get in the thing. Close the doors. Uh, Tim arrived. Peter Gallagher is there. Uh, Graham Aldous is there. Done a really good job editing the DVD first overland. And then what happens next is The cameras get set up. We fling the door. Oh, Michael Gear is there. Uh, He's the chap, fantastic engine mechanic who builds Series 1 engines and all sorts of engines. He was the chap that tried to organise the second Overland. He, unfortunately, it didn't happen, but that's what they were trying to do. 
So he's been a big fan of this and he's helping me all the way through. He's a chap that built the engine for me. And what happens next? We all get our, we all get organised, the doors open, bump, here we go. Tim just about starts crying. and mm-hmm. he's, he's touching his car again that people had talked about doing, but no one could actually do it. So he's touching his car and it's like, wow. And, and he's looking at the back of the car and he identifies straight away, this is definitely my hard top, no question about this. And he starts going through little bits and pieces that you would forget but then when it's in front of you, you would be able to point to and say, yeah, this bracket here is where we used to put our firmus flasks. This bracket here is where we did so-and-so. So he could identify this very, very quickly. He knew that it was the real deal. And it has to be the real deal because the other thing that in the background that was running with all this is that once I started researching cars on St. Helena, I got Bruce to research every series one on St. Helena. And there was five Series 1s on St. Helena, including Oxford. He knew everybody that owned them. He knew everything about them. It's his hobby. He loves Land Rover. So he photographs them. He catalogues the information. And through him asking people for me, so revisiting people and asking people again, he actually found another Series 1 on the island. So what he did then was, this is going backwards, but he did then gone through every Series 1 on the island And I gave him the information of, I want photographing this. I want every detail of every car photographing to make sure that none of my bits had got interchanged with another car. So we knew where we were. I knew how many axles there were. I knew what axles belonged to what vehicle, just to double check on everything. This was done very, very thoroughly. He checked out every pair of wings, every tub, every everything you can imagine he photographed it and sent me back the detail. And sometimes this would mean him going back and redoing a full set of photographs, which he did do. Uh, so that's in the background. So moving forward, we're in York, we're in the container. Tim's looking at the car. And then something really, it hadn't quite sunk into me, just what this car meant to people. Graham Aldous said, uh, is it okay if I touch the wing? i just like to touch the wing. Is it okay? So I said, yeah, yeah, of course it is, yeah. And he just touched the wing and he said, I never thought that, you know, I never thought I'd touch this car. And then you start to very, very quickly realise, you know, this had been a challenge for me to find this car and a challenge for me to bring it back. At this point, I still hadn't read the book first overland, even though Tim had given me a copy. Just like I said at the beginning of this, I'm severely dyslexic and reading to me is the worst thing I can possibly do. It is hard work. Once you realise you've got something that people see as being in the top five Land Rovers on the planet, then you start realising that you're doing a good thing. And that alters things very slightly because it means that even no matter how much something costs monetary and time-wise, time wise, we're doing something now which is good. So we looked, I looked, not we, I looked at build, and I thought to myself, I'm capable of doing this Front to back, I can do all this because I'm doing it with easy on. All I have to do is stop work with easy on and concentrate on this and I can do it. And I looked at it and I thought, how long will it take me to do it? And I thought, well, I can do it within five years. If it takes me five years to build this truck and Tim Slesser is 80, then, you know, he isn't going to be around to enjoy it as much. And the other crew members that I've since become friends with and the people that's left from the second expedition that I've become friends with, if I drag my heels with this, by the time I've done this, some of these people aren't going to be around to enjoy this. They're either going to be not here or physically not capable of enjoying it. So I decided to just pour money into it. That's what we did. We started pouring money into it. I came across a, a chap that I'd met before who got a garage. He's called Ben. He's got a, he's got a shop called Blackpool 4 by 4 and he found out, well, I confessed to him and said what I had. And he just said, can I see it? And he came along, can I look at what you've got? So I said, yeah, help yourself, have a look at what I've got. And he said, you, do you know what you've got here? So I said, yeah, I know what I've got here. Not really knowing what it meant to how and how many people it meant so much to. So he says, I'd love to be a part of this. Can, you know, how are you restoring it? So I said, well, I'm working on this idea. I'm going to do it myself. This is when I was still kicking the idea around. So he said, well, even if I'm, even if you can just do a few components for you, uh, you know, I'd like to do a few components for you. So I thought to myself, well, here we've got a willing person that's willing to do it. This is a man that does a lot with Series 1s. 
You know, he knows what he's talking about. He's in the same... York is a village. It's a small place. Very, very small. York, he can walk from one side to the other, walking in an hour. That's how small York is. So once you get somebody who rebuilds Series 1s in this little village, then I then turn from being the first primary restorer. Having said that, I did do the front axle myself because I wanted to be able to point to something and say, you know, I've done part of it, so I did the front axle myself. He became the primary restorer or reassembler, recommissioning. I became the person, the quartermaster. I was the person sourcing the parts, arranging that they were there on time, thinking in front, thinking in head of all the time, what might you need? How fast do I have to get them here? What is the fastest we can do with this? At the same time, all this is happening. We're getting organised with a chassis. I'm not sure whether you know, but there'd been problems in the UK with chassis. Production of replacement chassis had ceased due to a, a legal dispute and chassis weren't being produced. Then we run back to this thing that I've been telling you about, about how the car is blessed all the way along. We get as far as the needing a chassis and we'd got this chassis organised from Richard Chassis. We talked to them about chassis. They said they couldn't produce a Series 1. They were willing to sell me a Series 2, minus the outriggers, minus the rear cross members, and minus a few bits. I placed the order because they've got a long waiting list for production. Uh, I rang them up to see where my order was, and he said, the problem's been resolved. We're now going to produce Series 1. So I said, when? And he said, how soon do you want one? <laughs> and I said, well, I've already ordered this Series 2, so can we not just... Can I not you fill the order book with that order? So it brought it forward, so I get the correct chassis. And this is really good news. So we've got the chassis on order. We start looking at doing paperwork. Uh, I started conversations with a man called uh, Mike Byrne, who is in the Series 1 Owners Club. He's the chap in the Owners Club that does the paperwork for, re for recovering the title for vehicles. So we're working with him. We, we're getting all these parts. I then go to another place that's sort of 20 minutes away from here. A fantastic place. This is, a, this is a Wonderland place. This is a Disneyland for Land Rover This is a Blanchard. And they deal in uh, military surplus stock. And this, this warehouse yep. and these lovely, wonderful people, uh, Nick Blanchard, uh, and his dad, Peter Blanchard, have got everything brand new in stock, all bar the chassis I needed. But apart from that, they have everything, and I mean everything, new old stock from an early 88 right up to whatever you can dream they've got in stock. They are the people. Really expensive. However, if you want top quality and you want it now, these people can supply and if you're doing one car and you want to do one car properly and just do one in your life that's perfect, these are the people to go and see. You've got a Blanchard there, there supplying me all the parts. They're also a great place to find a, a, an ex-military Land Rover used. They yeah. had quite a field of them for what my, my meat wagon came out of Blanchard's. Yeah, absolutely. So they've got this stock, and, and it's quite unusual, really, because you look at this stock, and it just looks like an old big scrapyard full of 90s all packed up and one tens but then what you realize then is you realize that what they've got is they've got all these fantastic 90s and one tens that are all exportable to the states because they've all reached the age where they're now exportable so they're sitting on a gold mine they've got a wonderful collection they've probably got a hundred one ten and 90s just packed in two rows just on in on the car park but that's a different story Going back to the build, we're now building the car and we've got the chassis organised. I meet another chap that is a sheet metal worker that's starting to build metal things for well, aluminium parts and, and straighten aluminium parts and restore aluminium parts. And I'm working with this guy. He's called Steve. He's fantastic. I don't know. This thing just starts to come together. Michael Geary is building an engine. The gearbox gets shipped out to... Uh, our White House and Sons, they're in the Midlands, uh, uh, near not too far away from the factory, from Solihull. Uh, they're, they're doing the gearbox, they're pulling the gearbox together, and 
I'm doing the front axle, Ben's doing the back axle. This thing comes together very, very quickly because the normal problem is that you stuck for parts. But because I'd already started doing the easy on and I knew what the time delays were on ordering parts, I already had the heads up that I need to do order this now. So, for instance, the moment I had acquired the vehicle and I knew how long it was going to take before I had it, I'd booked in with White House was the gearbox reconditioners. I'd booked a slot in. Normally what they do is they accept a pallet with a gearbox on it and they it then sits in their shop for two or three months in a queue waiting to be done. So I said to them, I can't do this. Is this solid? Do I, ha do I have to send you a gearbox? And I said to them, I'll send you a gearbox and then when I get the proper one, throw that one in the bin and I'll give you the proper one. And when they realised that I was an eccentric Yorkshireman, they decided that that was a ridiculous and that they would just put my name in a book, something that they don't do. They want the gearboxes lined up so they know what they're doing. So they agreed to do it. So that meant the moment I got the gearbox, they had it, and then they had it back to me in no time. We talked earlier about cutting the, cutting the gear stick off, and we talked earlier about cutting the prop shafts. So what happened was I removed the gearbox uh, from the container, I took it up to a friend of mine's shop. It's called Acaster Forge. It's like an old school blacksmith shop. He's got all the kind of gear in there that you, you just amazing. And this friend of mine called James, who's got this shop, got the gearbox on his bench. We undid the prop shafts. He then set the prop shafts up and he re-welded the prop shafts up. A really neat job. Uh, put the two halves back together, seam welded around them and made the prop shafts hold again. And they're running on the vehicle now. That's unbelievable. But the back on, even though they'd been chopped in half, no fancy balancing, no fancy anything. They just worked first time. He got the gear stick, and the gear stick had been cut off through the sides. He placed the gear stick back on top, and he managed to put two wells in. And he said, do you want me to grind the wells down? I said, absolutely not. I need to be able to show everybody where we've been here. This thing's been cut. So what? It's been repaired. Do a good weld. Let everyone see you weld. What about the prop shafts? No. Leave them. They've been chopped. It's part of the story. They've been welded up. It's part of the vehicle. It's it's how it is now. Nothing's getting hidden. The gearbox went to White House. The first thing White House said is, somebody's welded up this top bracket. We can swap it for you. And I said, leave it exactly as it is. The gear stick's worn on top. Leave it exactly as it is. Don't touch the gear stick stuff. Because we know that that's, you know, totally original. So the gearbox is done. That comes back. Michael Geary builds a brand new engine using as many of the components of the original engine as possible. And that turned out to be a tremendous quantity of parts because Bruce went round and he collected all engine parts for Series 1s from all over the island. Most of them were sat in the rear tub. It was sort of like a final resting place for Land Rover Series 1 engine parts. So Michael Geary collected all the engine parts when the container was open. He took them all back home. He laid them all out, and he worked out what parts had come off Oxford's engine. And that seems impossible and unless you are an engineer that builds engines and you know a lot about series ones like he does. He quickly identified that this was this and that was that. And before you know where he are, he managed to, for instance, we had three of everything. We had three flywheels. We had three rocker covers. We had three of this. We had three of that. And sometimes we had four of something. So he went through all these bits. The cylinder head was special. The cylinder head, uh, we had four cylinder heads. And I lined them all up on a on, on a on a piece of uh, wood on the ground, on a piece of plywood, a sheet of plywood. And I looked at all the heads, photographed them from every angle so I could sit down and study them. And then I realized that one of these heads sent the pictures to Michael Geary and I said what do you think to the this is before that he'd, he'd taken the parts away uh, I'd, I'd, I'd sent the pictures of the heads down and I said to him what do you think to these and he identified very very quickly uh, that one of the heads had got a thermostat block on it with two pipes that had been chopped and capped off for the cab radiator the cab heater well of course on St Helena they don't need cab heaters it's the last thing they do it's boiling hot Nobody needs a radiator. So that was sort of saying, this is Oxford's head. It's got heater built into it. 
Then we're looking on it again and on the inlet manifold bolted to the head is the hand control brackets for the hand throttle because it had a hand throttle because of the turner, uh, not the turner, uh, the winch it had on the front, the coning winch on the front. So they had a hand throttle to the brackets on the inlet manifold. Uh, the inlet manifold had been drilled and tapped. And Michael Geary thinks that that had been some kind of a, a vacuum device that had been set up. So they, maybe when it went back to the factory, they could try and work out something to do with vacuum. We're not quite sure, but it's like a modification. Certainly nothing that had happened on Ascension or St. Helena, something that had been done in engineering. When we turned the cylinder head over, the valves had been stamped, the inlet valves had been stamped uh, with a punch, one, two, three, and four. And then we worked out that if you read First Overland, when the eight cars came back, uh, Land Rover stripped the engines down to assess them for wear and tear, and they did a decoke and they rebuilt it. So the stamping of these valves was when the head had been pulled down because on Ascension and on St. Helena, people don't pull heads to bits because they don't even have the dirt. They just can't skim a head. They can't do any of these things. So, you know, it's not what they're doing. It's The good news came when we flipped the head over and we realised that, very unusual, the head actually was date stamped in the casting and it was the right year and the right month. So, bingo, we've got the right head. So that's the engine done and where we are with the engine. The bulkhead arrives, the bulkhead gets painted, and uh, we make the decision that we're going to leave this uh, patina restoration where we're only going to paint the things that are new and we're not going to camouflage them or try and age them or distress them. We're going to make it very, very obvious. Uh, if it's got a new part on, it's painted the correct colour, it stands out, and it just is what it is. It will age and tone down eventually, but initially it is what it is. Everyone can see what's happened. So what we're getting here now is we're getting a vehicle that's been very well mechanically restored on a brand new chassis with all the lovely aluminium panels fitted back on top. And this thing's coming together with really, really quickly. The next part of the operation was to get the vehicle MOT tested so that we, the authorities know the vehicle's roadworthy. The good news about the vehicle is that a lot of problems that are happening in the UK at the moment with import vehicles are that people are importing Australian cars and the Australian cars have never been registered in the UK. And this then creates registration problems. However, Oxford is a UK car. We know the registration number. We know who owned it. We know everything there is to do about it. We've got the chassis number. We've got all these bits and pieces. We can prove it's a UK car. So by importing the vehicle back, it's although it had been 60-something years, on holiday, in reality, it's a UK car that's entering the country again. So it starts to make things a lot easier. So we drag the car, we, we, we drag the car back, we're rebuilding the car, and I'm processing all these different things. One of the things I'm processing is paperwork. Now, I'd, by this time, I had looked and I had read the articles Peter Gallagher wrote, and one of them showed the index card, which the licensing authorities had had in the 1950s when the vehicles had been exported. So Cambridge, if you look at the index card for Cambridge, that says the car was lost or exported to Iran. And the other one says who the who the, it was registered, Dr. Bernard Stonehouse, and it's got the details there. So I then contact the licensing office, not the licensing office, I contacted the registry office uh, who'd registered the vehicle originally. And it's just chance. Sometimes they've got the information, sometimes they haven't. In the UK, it's 50-50. Keeping records from all that time ago is a big thing. So I rang the local the local office up. I was talking to a girl, a young lady, and I said to her, I'd, under the freedom of information, I'd like to get information on this vehicle. Do you have it? She said, wait a minute. What's the number? She said, we've got all SNX numbers on record. So I said, fantastic. How do I get, the, how do I get a copy of your information? She said, you've got to fill in a freedom of information request, I'll email you it now, you fill it in, you send it back to us, we charge you £20, and then you get the information that you want. And she said, there it is. Can I have your email address, please? I gave her my email address, and she said, are you Adam Bennett? Now, bearing in mind, she's in the Midlands, so this isn't someone in the same village. This is somebody that's living and working four hours away from here. 
So I said, yeah, that's me. She said, oh, she said, uh, I was a student at York University. She said, I rented one of your houses. <laughs> oh, fantastic to speak to you again. And she was an ex-tenant of mine. You could not make up. I mean, she was doing me no favours. Uh, this was going to happen anyway. It was just fate that instead of finding somebody that could have been very awkward and not helpful, I found somebody that was enthusiastic, helpful, and she knew me. So she processed the paperwork. The paperwork came through. It's exactly what I needed. So I've got the paperwork from her. I've got the paperwork from importing the vehicle because when you import a vehicle, uh, there's paperwork saying what's in the container. I'd paid the duty on that. The milkman from the Series 1 Owners Club, whose real name is uh, Mike Burns, uh, he does the registration applications. Uh, he said that he'd do this for me. He gave me a list of things that he needed. And from the list of things that he needed, uh, the MOT and these various pieces of paperwork, Tim Slasser did a covering letter, which basically read something like this. I'd like you to support this application to get the registration number reassigned back to this vehicle. I can identify that this vehicle, I collected the vehicle when it was new from the factory on this day in 1955, because Tim's got his diaries and he can tell you what he was doing on every single day. So he wrote a letter to the licensing authority saying, I can identify this vehicle because modifications were made by Land Rover for our expedition, and only two vehicles were modified in this way, and this is my vehicle. Please, can we have the number back? So the licensing authorities decided that they'd give us it back, and this is another one of these fluky things. The paperwork arrived back from the licensing authority very, very quickly without any, no problems. It just arrived back. They didn't come to inspect it. They could have done. They could have asked a load of questions. They didn't do. They processed it very, very well, very efficiently. The paperwork came through, and the logbook came through. That's the V5. That's, the, that's I'm trying to think, the title, the title. So the title came through, and the date it came through was something like the exact date that First Overland had left the UK. Obviously, the year was different, but the month and the day was the exactly the same. That the, You couldn't make up that it was the same thing, another 30-30 thing. So we went, and uh, once you've got the... Once you've got the title in the UK and the vehicle also had come through as uh, historic, so it means that you don't have to pay for to use the vehicle on the road. It's free of charge. I put some insurance in place, and bingo, we've got the car on the road. So, so there we go, really. And how long from that? How long, how long from the time that you that received the vehicle, got out of the container, the Tim saw it until it was it passed the MOT and was road capable? Four months? No, less. Wow. Three. Wow, that's. I mean, the whole story is amazing. That part is three, also three, three months. All it, I it can was, say is, damn. Yeah, damn. Yeah, <laughs> right on. So what happened was, we now been. You may know the story. Graham Aldous was an eleven-year-old schoolboy. He was at the side of the road in London. His mum had sent him to the shops. He's just got a handful of shopping. He looks up, and Cambridge whizzed past him, with all the equipment on it and three young men in it. And they were setting off for the airport as, as the first leg of the journey. And he went home and he said to his dad, I've just seen a Land Rover expedition vehicle. And his dad later got the book and read the book. And after he'd read the book, passed it to Graham, who read the book. And then Graham Aldous became hooked right from back in 1955. Graham Aldous is now covering the story. He's, he's doing a video diary of what's happened just so the moments had been captured and nothing was lost. Tim agreed to come up on the train because Tim wants to jump on the train and come up as fast as he can to see his car reassembled. He'd been up once before, halfway through the build. Uh, he came up on my birthday, the 7th of July. Uh, he came up on the train. It was a great day. It was sort of, it was nearly there, but not quite there. And there was lots for him to see and look at. He even fitted some of the new parts, uh, which was good fun. But on the day the car was done, Graham was there, and it, uh, we collected Tim from the train station. London's two hours away by train. Tim lives in London. We got him to the garage, Blackpool 4x4 garage, where the car was, and now the car is sat there, and it's... Let me think when he saw that. Tim saw the car 
before we'd got, let me think what stage we were at with paperwork. Tim saw the car as fast as humanly possible. So he saw the car before we'd finalised the paperwork with the DVLA. Thinking about it, we restored the car in two months. So the rest of the time was spent registering it. So Tim got in the car first time ever. He'd been in it for all that time. Graham got a camera rolling. We drove up the road. Graham Aldous jumped in the passenger seat. Tim Slesser jumped in the driver's seat. I jumped. Of course in the back. he did. Yeah, of just course like he did. Ben, who'd uh, built the car, he jumped in the back, and we all sit there. And uh, Tim starts the car up and says, "Wow, you know this this steering is. Uh, you know, it forgotten how heavy the steering was. It just didn't know how heavy the steering was. It forgotten that there were no servo assisted brakes." It forgotten about all the rattles. It's used to driving a new modern car. It forgotten exactly what it was like to drive an old car. So all of a sudden he realized that, you know, these things took some driving. He's also start- not 22 years old anymore. Correct. So we start driving and, and the farm where the garage is, is sort of, it's on a, it's on a big farm. So there's lots of uh, roads you can drive on without having to worry about going on the road and things like this. Out of interest, Tim is now on my insurance, so he's allowed to legally drive the car on the road. And the insurance company, you know, they were amazed that I was adding somebody who was 86 years old to the policy. And I said, oh, you know, come on. You know, nothing's going to go wrong. And, oh, yeah, we'll add him to the policy. So anyway. He's he's going to drive it anyway, so you may as well have him on there. Absolutely. It's going to happen. Well, and lots more. I'll tell you about some more people who've driven the car since then. We go for a drive in the car, Graham videos him. Within a few minutes, it's like he's back in his old friend and he knows where the gears are and he knows where it all is. And we're just stood there or sat there absolutely silent, thinking, you know, is this really happening? Because this is fast. This isn't when we'd got the paperwork done. This is two months after the container landed, the car's finished, and Tim Slesser's in the car driving it again. Wow. Please tell me somebody filmed that. Yeah, Graham Aldous filmed it. My son got a few little bits and pieces, I think. I'm trying to think who filmed it. I'm trying to think how, how that happened. Anyway, it's filmed and it's photographed. Yeah. And uh, We think Gra- Graham's working on a... a is, is, that's his next video, I believe. Yeah, Graham's producing uh, After Overland. Yeah. And basically, in one way he loves me and in the other way he gives me a kick because... He's created this great DVD, but at the end of the DVD, it talks about how the cars are lost and destroyed. Right. So right. now he's had to rewrite his, yes. his, when he does that, he does sort of speeches and talks to people. Mm-hmm. He's had to rewrite the ending. And of right. course, this thing doesn't end no. because the car isn't in a museum. And this is the great news because if the car was in a museum, Tim Slessor would have driven it maybe once, never again. And then that would be the end of the story. But you see, this isn't ending because the eccentric Yorkshire man won't put the car in a garage. He won't put it in a museum. He won't put it on a trailer. He wants to drive the car everywhere, and he wants people to drive the car. You're a good man. And have the photograph taken inside the car. This is Tim driving the car. And I suppose the next thing that was sort of happening was Peter Galilee was being a lifelong supporter of this vehicle. I was sort of keeping him sort of up to date with where we were. And I, I rang him up and I said, uh, well, I'd emailed him and I'd said, you know, we'd, we're going to take the vehicle for the ministry inspection and we're taking it next week. You might like to come. He said, too, right, I'd like to come. Ben had pulled a bit of a stunt, really, and he'd moved it forward, you know, because everything gets moved forward. Nothing gets put back. Everything moves forward. So Ben had moved this forward. I'm looking at the clock and thinking it was maybe 10 o'clock and, and Ben said, well, actually, I'm taking it for MOT in an hour's time. And I said, what? Uh, so I rang Peter Gallon and I said, I'm really, really sorry, Peter, but it's not next week. It's in an hour's time, and I'm really sorry about this. So Peter dropped everything and put the phone down. In fact, he didn't pick up. That's what had happened. I left a voicemail for him. So I just said, I'm really sorry. I've got to go, Peter. It isn't next week. You're going to miss this. I'm really sorry about it. But Ben's brought it forward, and... Uh, I'll let you know how we get on. Peter Gallaghy must have walked in, pressed play, and then once he'd pressed play and he'd heard what had happened, he jumped in his car, and he doesn't live local. It looks like on the map, but it's a drive, a proper drive away. We, got in the, we get in Oxford. We're going for the ministry test. The tanks are empty. The twin tanks are empty. Ben's put a little bit of old petrol out of a cannon. 
just enough to start the thing. And he says, we need petrol. What are we going to do? So I said, well, we're going to drive to the garage and we're going to fill up with juice. You know, we, we need petrol. We're going to go and fill up. Driving down the road, Ben's driving because obviously, you know, he's got the insurance to drive the car because he's taking it for the test. And, and it was his, you know, it was his build. It was right that he should drive the car first on the road. For me to take the glory of that when he's done the build, would be it would be not good. So he gets the the first drive. I'm uh, I'm sat next to him. Uh, my son Miles is sat in the back, and we're driving down the road and we're looking at each other. And this has happened so quickly. We start saying things like, "Can anyone really believe? Is this really happening? Is this some kind of a dream? Are we really driving Oxford to the petrol station to fill up with petrol?" And the last time this car was really driving in this country was in 19, uh, 1957 or whenever, 58, when it left for, Ascent, uh, for uh, Ascension. So we're just coming to terms with this, and we're basically very quiet, and I'm fumbling around with my iPhone trying to get video on, and my son's trying to make a little bit of a video. And as we're driving along, Ben says, look who's coming in the other direction. And he says, Peter Galilee. So I said... Well, how did he know where we were? Well, Peter had worked out that he had to get his foot down quickly. His face, as he saw Oxford drive towards him, because this had, you know, it come together that fast. He hadn't really realised how fast it had come together. And his face was sort of, I can't describe his face. So he spun his car around in the middle of the road and he chased us to the petrol station and we're just sort of filling up the car with petrol like you do. And Peter came and he, he just looked, it was just in, it wasn't in reporter mode. It was in very shocked mode. So I said to him, why don't you let me drive your car, Peter? And why don't you jump in with Ben and, and go for a drive in Oxford? Because that's what you do, isn't it? You go for a drive in the car. So Peter got in and he was speechless, absolutely speechless. And we went for the MOT and Peter came with us. Fortunately, Peter was with us because he had his camera and he was able to get a load of photographs of taking the car for the MOT. This mad moment of Ben saying it's in an hour's time, I rang my other uh, good friend, Land Rover enthusiast, Robert Sargent, who had been one of the chaps helping us unload the uh, container. A really, really good person to have sort of helping you do these, uh, j just for an extra somebody to speak to, how to, should you do, what do you think to this, a great guy. And I rang him up and said, I'm really sorry for the short notice, but you're going to miss this thing. And, and he just stopped everything he was doing. He's got a New South Wales Series 1 pickup. He jumped in his pickup with his daughter and, and raced down to the MOT garage. So he was there like a with his camera as well. And it was like the MOT testing man put you know, the cars there. It's looking tremendous. And he's sort of looking at this and wondering why all these people got cameras. Why is everyone here? What, what is this about? This is an old Land Rover because the sign writing's not on. And he doesn't know what, you know, he doesn't know the story. He's just doing his job. He starts doing his job, and he's very impressed by it. He goes on the lift, and everything's new underneath, and everything's good. And, uh, you know, he writes the paperwork out. Tremendous. And we drive the car back, lots of photographs, little video clips here and there where possible, and, and the car's mot So that's the first time the car drove on the road, and it was a real big thing. It, it, was, uh, it was a big thing. So that's sort of the first time Tim, Tim drove it around the farmyard, then, then we drove it on the road to take it for for the for the ministry test there, so so that's there. So I'm not quite sure what you want me to tell you next. Next on the Center Steer Podcast for the fifth anniversary edition, we talk with Tim Slesser. Tim Slesser is Land Rover royalty, and we felt very honored to speak with him. We called Tim on his cell phone. Though he wanted us to call him on his landline, there was a technical issue. Thankfully, the cell phone quality held up, and it was very good. Tim is one of the members of the first Overland and rode in the Oxford truck itself. He's 86 now, and he's only one of three that remain from that original Overlanding. Nigel, Pat, and Tim are all still with us. Uh, Tim references the Yorkshireman, that is Adam Bennett, and the Cambridge truck. So we'll hear more about uh, that from Adam himself next month. And now that interview, pretty much unedited and unfiltered. And it, well, look, look uh, let's go do the best we can on the on the cell phone. I agree. I agree. So uh, just want to make sure you know who's on the line with us. Uh, myself, uh, Harold, and Morgan. Uh, gentlemen, say hello to Tim. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello, hello, Harold and Morgan. Nice to talk to you. Likewise. Um, and, and you too, sir. 
We're great fans. We've been doing the show for five years. Uh, we're a monthly podcast. Every month we talk about Land Rovers, overlanding, adventuring. Our very first guest right. on the show was Graham Aldis. He was talking about the first. Oh, right. And he was talking about the first overland and among and other his other videos. And so it's for us, it's a great honor to have you on the show for we're gonna make this our fifth anniversary show. So thank you for coming on. Well, it's, and, a great, it's a great great honor for me. I'm a I'm a rabid American of file. <laughs> um, I lived for three year, lived for three years in the United States and uh, I've written a book about um, my adventure, so to speak, in the American West. I lived for a year in western Nebraska. Most Americans are sophisticates from the East Coast, like <laughs> yourselves, <laughs> tend to say, Nebraska? What do you want to live in Nebraska for? Anyway, that's another story. But No, um, no. No, I'm, actually, I'm, uh, I, would, I would just say I'm sorry, Tim, and, and leave it at that. Ah! I'm, from the mid, I'm from the Midwestern United States, so I have a little bit closer perspective on it. Oh, right, 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 well, right. T- well, Tim, mo- I... Most Americans uh, so it seem, seem to me to come either from the East or the West Coast. The, 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 the flyover states, isn't it? Kansas and... Kansas, and, Nebraska. Uh, Nebraska, yes. Montana. That's anyway, right. let's get back to land. I'm always amazed that, that um, you know, that you, you folks are interested in Land Rovers because you've got some bloody good vehicles of your own, like Jeeps and... <laughs> and um, Oh, you know the, the big the big pickups. The you, Ford. You, well, you, you get them more out in the west. Anyway, well, that's that's very nice, Tim. But we don't say the J word on this show. <laughs> oh, we don't. No, it's okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> No, Sorry. no, no. Tip. Censor that bit out. Censor it out. No, no, no. Actually, where Harold and I live near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, is actually the oh, right. the original home of the of the uh, Bantam Jeep. And of course, the Bantam Jeep right. came from Butler, Pennsylvania, which is just uh, about an. I can be there in an hour. Uh, both Harold and I can get there in an hour right. hour's drive. And the right. ba- and so the ba- and Bantam could not keep up with the contract to provide the U.S. Uh, military with enough Jeeps in World War II. That contract was then given to Ford and Willys and other people, and that's the Jeep that was right. then, of course, sent around the world. And the Jeep, of course, is you know really the ancestral uh, beginning of Land Rover because all those Jeeps were, were yes, sitting around yes, the U.K. Mm-hmm. So there is a, quite a tie uh, between uh, this podcast where we're based, Jeeps and Land Rover. It's right. all a nice little connection. And, it, and you, I know you if you like history, which I really do too, there's a, a great connection. Pittsburgh is named after a British prime minister, and uh, you know, so there's a. Great oh connection. yes, 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 absolutely. I, I I lived I worked for nearly two years in Syracuse. Um, oh yeah. Which is not a million miles from Pittsburgh. No, it's not. And um, you know, I was down to Pittsburgh once or twice at least. I've been there. Oh well. I, uh, we 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 love you even more. The fact that you've been to Pittsburgh because we're very proud of Pittsburgh. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You, you should come again. It's still very nice. I, I, well, I, if better. I get any money, I will. I was in the States in September. Um, I was asked to join a history, history panel to talk about um, the 125th anniversary of a thing called the Johnson County War in Wyoming. Oh. And um, I, they seem to think I knew something about it. <laughs> um, it, it was, it's a, you know, it's a classic, the big barons. The big cattle barons against the incoming um, much more, more humble settlers, and some of the big barons were Brits, needless to say. Sure. <laughs> and well, uh, Sard got interested in. Interesting. Uh, yeah, but anyway, so that's another story. No, no, no. Um, I, what else? I'm, we, I'm already enjoying. That, I'm that already was enjoying this. Uh, one one of the uh, big characters in Great Expectations was a transplanted cattle baron, was it not? Right. Right, yes. Well, you're better informed on that aspect than I am. But um, there were quite a lot of Brits involved. And and indeed, uh, you know, if you travel across Wyoming and Montana, even today, you'll find sort of relics of of the Brits. There's a ranch near Buffalo, Wyoming, called the IXL, which is actually not IXL. It's it's 12L, 12 Lancers, and it was two officers... In about 1890, retired officers of the British uh, Cavalry Regiment who went out there to breed horses for to send to the Boer War, and um, there's some cowboys took took them took the horses and and, and they started to join the fun and 
have a go at the at the bulls. Anyway, that's another. But this, don't get me started no, <laughs> on no. that part of history because I'm fascinated this, by it. This is very interesting. It's not at all where I saw this conversation going. Oh, but but uh, yeah, <laughs> this is fun. I, I, I no, I this is great. I like this. We're also history well, efficient. I'll send you a copy of my book. Um, email me your you know your postal address at some stage, and I'll send you a copy of. It's actually published in America, but but uh, yes. um, it's got, in America, well, you know, you could maybe get one. You can get it from yeah. Amazon. It it's is on called Amazon. Out West. It's called Out West, and it's by Tim Slesser, and it's published by Interlink uh, in uh, Massachusetts. Well, I anyway. think we need to plug this for um, our listeners. Uh, yes, and it is available on <laughs> Amazon. I've already looked it up. It's, uh, I believe it's, uh, I thought I, I had the price here. I apologize. But it is available on uh, on Amazon. And it is uh, stories about the, the, the Old West. And you wrote that, Tim, because uh, you have that, obviously, have that fascination yeah. uh, as we do for history. And um, that's cool. I, I need to tell you about Nebraska. Have you, I need to actually ask a question. Have you been to Carhenge and Alliance? Oh, uh, yes, uh, Alliance. Uh, see, I, were, I, I got a job. Oh, this is uh, 1965. It's quite a long time ago. Wow. <laughs> um, I got I wasn't uh, born, I Tim. pissed off with my boss in the BBC. I worked for the BBC. I make documentaries. That's what I did. And I got I got bored with my boss, and I up, up, up and quit with my wife and two very small children. And I got a job um, for which I was quite unqualified. Namely, teaching what they said uh, we'll we give you a job teaching communications at Shadron State College. Shadron is a small town up in the extreme north uh, northwest corner of Nebraska, um, just yep. south of the uh, South Dakota line and a little bit uh, east of the Wyoming line. Yep. Uh, yeah, communications. I thought, well, you know, I know about journalism. It wasn't communications at all. It was freshman English. <laughs> but by the time that by the time I discovered that and and wrote and said I you know I can't do it, I'd already quit the BBC. And anyway, the boss man, the dean at the college, said, "Hell, you know, you you've been to Cambridge, you got a degree, you've written a book. What's the problem?" So it was a very good year, and I've been going back to see them ever since. And uh, you know, Nebraska, uh, yeah. Well, that was but well, that's only about uh, thirty miles, thirty-five miles. Um, North of Alliance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, uh, si since that time in Alliance, uh, a gentleman has recreated, <clears throat> excuse me, has, has recreated a replica of the Stonehenge using old cars. Yes, it's called yes. Carhenge. Correct. And that's what yes. John was oh, asking no, I've been, if you've I've seen been, that. I've been there. Yeah, I've been there. In fact, uh, one of the nice ladies that I met out there was, uh, you know, one of the guides, I think. Um, I can't remember the detail, but oh yes, yeah. now I've been to Carhenge. Yes, I, I was there uh, myself. Sir. I, that, that's my that's my that's my stamping ground. Is uh, Alliance, Chadron, Crawford, Scotts Bluff, Mitchell. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah. Yes, indeed. Wow, what what a, what a destination for a Brit, North Platte. <laughs> well, 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 yes, yes. <laughs> um, but but uh, you know it's marvelous 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 country. I'm, yes, it if, is. I sometimes say if I was a billionaire or a millionaire, I'd have a private jet, and I'd commute between um, where I live in Wimbledon, just a uh, suburb of London, and um, probably Buffalo, Wyoming, uh, which is one of my, probably my favorite favorite wow. town. Nice. Because um, from well, Buffalo. You can get in a day's drive out and back to, you know, so many places like uh, Custer's, last, uh, a little bit of um, Hole in the Wall, which is which Cassidy hideout, um, the, the the Johnson County War. Um, um, it's just, uh, anyway. <laughs> well, I'm this, sure this, we're not talking about Land Rovers. That's, we're we're going to do well, that now. We're going to do that we now. Can, we can do that, and I can tell you one uh, one way we can bring this back on topic is to tell you if you do want to come and see this country, an excellent way to do that is from behind the wheel of a vintage Land Rover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think you might I, know I, how to do that. Well, um, diverting but slightly. Um, I don't know whether you know you know about this expedition that we did in 1955-56, first overland to Singapore. 
Um, one of those two vehicles, the dark blue one, the Oxford car, uh, which was exported and went off to St. Helena Island in the South Atlantic and gave good service for about 30, 40 years and then eventually you know, gave up the ghost. It was too old parked in the grass, and the cab was removed and turned into a chicken chicken uh, coop. And um, people re- phoned me oh, quite frequently, well, every two or three years, and say, oh, we're going to bring it back, we're going to bring it back. And it never happened, because about a year ago, a fellow from Yorkshire did, and he bought it back in bits, because it's a total wreck. And he spent for forty thousand pounds, which was you know fifty fifty five thousand dollars, rebuilding it. And it's now it, it it went down to Italy a few weeks ago to a classic motor show. And um, what he wants to do, I don't know if it will happen. He wants to ship it to Singapore, and then have it have me and some others drive it back. <laughs> <laughs> to the UK, <laughs> uh, not not the route that we went, because we couldn't go through Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and all that, but you could do it through the through Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and the, 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 anyway, I divert, but um, anyway, I'm always surprised when I see, because uh, driving around in the US, you don't see too many Land Rovers, and when I do see one, I always go up if they're, you know, the gas station or supermarket car park or wherever, and um, ask them about it and explain my interest. Um, and they're always very, everybody is always very hospitable. At the end of the, uh, we know about the first overland. At the end of the first overland, it's not much talked about as the return trip. Was that as eventful as the trip getting there? Uh, uh, well, uh, we didn't uh, attempt to, to retrace our steps back through Thailand and into Burma and up into northern Burma and then over the uh, Stillwell Road. You know about the Stillwell Road? Yes. Built by General Benedetto Stillwell, American. Um, that that, yes. uh, that leader, lead, sometimes there's the leader road, sometimes the Stillwell Road. Uh, but it, it was built in 1943 by the Americans to... to, to uh, get supplies into Chiang Kai-shek, the Chinese nationalist who was fighting the Japanese. But at the end of the war, 1945, <clears throat> there was no purpose in the road. It, it, it was purely strategic. There's never been still isn't, uh, any sort of intercourse between uh, uh, the northeast part of India, Assam, uh, and the northern part of Burma, although they're only two or three hundred miles apart, there's no, the different religion, different culture, different language, different everything. But as I say, the Americans built the war, built the road during the war, and 1945 it was abandoned, and that was our problem. We were told, you know, oh, <laughs> it's been abandoned. There's no way you'll make it. But um, extraordinarily, we did make it. Right. Um, okay. Much more. Cr- I would say easy, but easier than we had anticipated. Um, and once we'd cracked that, then there was only one other um, place in southern Thailand where there was no road at all. But again, once again, the Americans came to, in a sense, to the rescue. The American military attaché in Bangkok got in touch with us. We were in Bangkok trying to work out. We, we figured we'd drive down the railroad. There was a railroad, but there was no road. And he said, well, he just, the American military attaché, he'd just come back from southern Thailand, and he could tell us that the three bulldozers had just been blasted a a track through the last hundred miles of, you know, no road jungle. They had blasted a track through so so, so, so that surveyors could get in and plot uh, the actual route route of a, of a highway, which was, wasn't actually built until about two years later, but we were able to take the track that the, uh, the bulldozers had made, and once we'd done that, we'd, we'd cracked it. <laughs> we were into Malaya and the best road since, oh, since Germany, since the Autobahn, 10,000 miles behind. But coming back, the return journey, you no, know, we took a ship, we had three weeks in Singapore, and then we took a ship with the two vehicles from Singapore to Calcutta and uh, India. And then we drove back from Calcutta 
a rather different route to the one we'd taken on on going out to, to Singapore, um, but back through India and Pakistan and then into Afghanistan. And Afghanistan at that time, you know, no, no great problem. And into northern uh, northern Iran, or, or as it was then known, Persia, and then um, into Turkey and so on. Um, that took us about uh, well, about three months, I think. And it was in Iran but, uh, that the it, Cambridge truck was in lost. Because, yep. Hello. I say it was in it was the Cambridge truck was lost in Iran. Is that correct? So, sorry, say again. The Cambridge truck it was lost in Iran on the way on the return journey. Yes, 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 yes. Um, see, when we got back, the car, the vehicles went back to um, uh, went back to the as it was then the Rover Car Company. They repaired them and they gave they gave they lent. They lent the one I was mostly I was involved with the the, the dark blue one, the Oxford. Uh, they gave that to a bird watching expedition, which went to Ascension Island, and, and then from Ascension it was shipped to uh, to Santa Helena. The other one was lent to a three man expedition. I don't quite know what they were doing. They were doing some research work in in Iran, or as it then was Persia. And uh, two of the crew flew back. I don't think there wasn't uh, there wasn't a fallout. It was always arranged that they had to be back, and leaving the third one to drive drive the vehicle back. But it, at night it came off the road and fell down into a sort of bit of a chasm, sort of mini canyon. And um, it was lucky because the, the headlights did not uh, were not affected. And someone coming along an hour or two later saw the headlights at the bottom of the little canyon and went down and found the driver who was trapped, broken in both, both, both his legs. And he was taken off to the hospital, and nobody knows what happened to the vehicle. I met for the first time, oh, about three months ago, I met the, the driver who <laughs> came to a bit of a, a sort of party that um, uh, was being thrown. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> I see <laughs> You switch me up, I can burble on for hours. No, that's great. That, I don't think many people uh, know what had happened to the to the uh, Cambridge truck. So, so this... well, Adam Adam Bennett is sort of he's trying to sort of mount not an expedition, but he's try, he's doing kinds of research to try to find it. Um, I've told him not I'm not normally a sort of pessimist, but I've told him he's really in a polite way he's wasting his time because. It will have been sort of cannibalized almost immediately by the peasants living in that particular rather remote area, not very far from Mount Ararat, you know, old, old Noah and yes, all that bit. Yes. Um, so um, it's a fairly remote part of Persia, of Iran, uh, and I, I don't think he'll ever find it. But still, he's such an optimist, it's difficult to switch him off. <laughs> well, he he's on a mission from God. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't know whether you see Yorkshiremen um, in to to Brits. Yorkshiremen are, are, are sort of rather special. Um, you get what you see. You, you know, if they say they'll do something, they bloody do it. Um, they're, they're very direct and. Um, Sort of attractive. He's he's not by birth or anything a wealthy man. He's made quite a little bit of money. Well, he must have because he was prepared to spend a packet on that on rebuilding the Oxford. Uh, getting the Oxford car back from Saint Helena cost him probably about ten thousand bucks, and he had to send another. Uh, a defender, a new, newish Land Rover, out as a swap. As a guy who had the wreck didn't really want to let it go. I don't know why he wanted to hang on to it. But um, that's, that's the way it was. Um, yeah, but Adam Bennett, you know, he's a good man. Good man. Yes. I have a, a specific question because of my heritage. Uh, I, on the on the trip out on the first overland, and, uh, did you go right. through? Did you go through Bulgaria? Because my family history is Bulgarian and Macedonian, and and I, uh, that part of the journey seemed to be glossed over. Uh, but I'm kind of curious if you you had any memories of Bulgaria at all, or uh, did you go through? No, that? Okay. Uh, no, we didn't. We went. I mean, my, my we went. Um, 
France, and then, well, we crossed the Channel from England, and we went to France, Paris. Then we had to go to Germany, I think to Cologne, to pick up some, ca- uh, some uh, photographic kit that had been supplied to us by the National Geographic magazine. Then we went to Austria, and from Austria into what was then Yugoslavia, um, right. and down uh, to Belgrade, and from Belgrade into Greece. Um, and then from Greece into Turkey, and Turkey across the, uh, Istanbul, across the Bosphorus, which was the only sea crossing we made, which takes about eight minutes. In Yugoslavia? Um, and then Turkey. And so, we, no, we didn't go to Bulgaria. And then, which, of course, in those days, you know, in those days you had the... The, 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 uh, the, the Iron Curtain. Curtain and, mm-hmm. uh, or, you know... It, when you were in Yugos- war. when you were in Yugoslavia, did you happen to get to Lake Okrid? Do you remember Lake Okrid? It's O H R I D. Say again. Okrid. O H R I D. Is it spelled? No. I, I, well, I, if, I, if we did, I don't remember. Not it. a problem. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's where my grandfather's from. So I'm just kind of curious. That's oh all. right. Yeah, just kind of curious. He he emigrated right. to the U S. in right. 1922 or 1921. So um, right. he not right. that he was there. Anyway, uh, thank you for that indulgence. I was just kind of curious as when I when I watched the the video. Oh, no, no, not at all, not at all. Yes, not at all. Yeah, and I think we need to plug that video in the show notes uh, as well because it's it's a phenomenal video and and the information from from Tim and his cohorts is is very good in that. Now, when you talk about the video, you're talking about Graham Aldous's uh, video, are you? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. He's making another one about the sort of rescue and restoration of the Oxford car. In fact, he's coming to my apartment in about, um, or today, one week, to interview me about it. I don't know that I can help him much, but he's a good, he's a good friend. <laughs> so yes, he is. Do what I can. Yeah, I, I think you've perhaps done a little bit of a leak because we were talking to Graham and he said he was working on something but didn't t- want to tell us what it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's what it is. In fact, I'm sure that's what it is. Um, that that sounds he excellent. Also made what, he may also made, he's done a bit of a video. <clears throat> you see, two years later, Barrington Brown, the photographer on, on, a, on our expedition, and, and I bought a, a Land Rover out of Rovers, uh, went off and did an assignment for the. We, we drove as fast as we could to India. Uh, and um, I think we were London to India in about three weeks, <laughs> exhausted when we got there, um, because we were on a sort of totally commercial thing, making some documentaries for the BBC and for the BBC educational thing. Uh, you know, we did a film about for kids, sort of 12 and 13, you know, education, but you got life in an Indian village, that kind of thing. What yeah, movement was Gra- that? Gra- Graham Aldous got hold of the film, and 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 he sent it to me, uh, and, asked, and I said, well, "No, it's not very good. It, it, you know, there's no, it's not solid enough." So, he, but he's he's a great trier, is uh, uh, Aldous, and I think he'll make a good job of the of the um, of the sort of second half uh, yes. about the restoration and the rescue restoration of uh, we agree. the Oxford car. Yeah. So uh, agreed. So this second uh, this uh, second trip that you and BB took, uh, what Land Rover? Sorry, sorry, say again. The the trip the second trip that you took with BB, what Land Rover was that? Was model? Uh, that was a series two. That was a series two, which we bought, which we didn't want. I didn't want to be didn't want to be beholden. I mean, I mean nothing against the Rover Car Company. But I didn't want to be beholden to them in any way. I didn't want to have to sort of slow down and do any, uh, you know, advertising and PR for them as we did in the first trip. Uh, so we bought it, bought the land over for cash. Uh, and and we, when it eventually came back to England, um, we driven back by some other people. I flew back. Um, you know, we, we sold it. Oh. So I really don't know what happened to it. Oh. I think I think Adam Bennett is is, is sort of um, <laughs> he's looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a Sorry? very very specific directed collection for him. It seems to me he collects well, yes, only he, vehicles he, he, you're associated with. 
Well, he's a, he's a delightful eccentric, but he is an eccentric. <laughs> I mean, anybody who's going to spend that amount of money bringing a wreck back from Santa Elena, um, you know, wholly admirable, but, but pretty eccentric way of spending your money. I mean, as I say, I admire him, and I get on very well with him. He's, a, he's an entertaining character. Well, you inspired a, a number of people over the years, uh, including us, to to take journeys and, and use Land Rover. So those are very storied cars, and they're very important and special. What Adam Bennett is doing is, uh, I, I think, is a, is a wonderful thing. And well, it's actually the the amount that he's paying to do a restoration like that, including the recovery, is actually not outlandish compared to what it costs to get or rebuild a Land Rover here in the U.S., I was going to say the same thing. Uh, that's that's a reasonable price he's paying. If I right. well, if, that's interesting. If I told you, uh, I, I could tell you how much I've spent on restoring uh, Land Rovers, uh, Tim. It's 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 not, comparative to what I think uh, uh, that uh, Adam has spent. It's probably in the same ballpark. It's uh, that, you know, w- wait here. till you see the bill, John. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh right, uh, right. Did, right. Yeah, Har- right, Harold's right, uh, restoring right. a Defender for me. I'm. Uh, I think it's going to be a second mortgage on the house. Oh yeah. <laughs> Well, but on well, the other hand, for what they sell for in this country, you could still make money. So, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh-huh. I mean, as I say, I'm, you know, going back ten minutes. I'm, still, I'm quite surprised at the, well, your enthusiasm for 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 Land Rover. I mean, they, you know, they're fine vehicles, but as I say, I won't use the J word, but you know, you've got pretty damn good vehicles yourself. I was walking along the street oh, about an hour ago. And um, two of those, what, what do they call them, uh, that the American Army... Um, um, uh, Humvees? Oh, God, what are they called? The, the Hummer, yeah. The Hummer, the Humvee. Yeah, Hummers. Yeah, two Hummers went by. Well, you don't see too many Hummers in England, but the, the, two, the two of them, I mean, they weren't, they, you know, they were civilian, but they you know, said, so what the hell are you having? <laughs> <laughs> so, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by the... Well, I think, uh, sir, it, it goes to what you did is uh, the association Land Rovers have with adventure, overlanding, travel and doing uh, doing interesting things around the world. Jeep does not have that. Uh, I, I, you know, you don't often hear I don't I don't recall and it, maybe it's happened where uh, someone takes a Jeep and drives to Tierra del Fuego. Usually when you hear about someone driving to Tierra del Fuego, it's in a Land Rover, maybe a Toyota, uh, maybe a Unimog. Uh, but Jeeps are yes. just, they're not associated well, th- with uh, with adventure I think travel. Jeeps had that association for a brief time in the early 1940s, which began. Oh, Land yes, Rover. yes. And then, I mean, there was there's some there's a. There's a good film about a couple of chaps who, uh, who um, drove down uh, uh, to Panama, uh, which, which in in 19, you know, 52 or whenever was 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 quite difficult to do. Um, but have have you come across? There's a very good American um, magazine comes out, I think, two, three, four times a year, called Overland Journal. Mm-hmm. Yes. Have you come oh, yes. across that one? Yes. Right. Because there's now a European version of it um, uh, in English. Uh, I, I say in English because it's actually produced in Germany. But the fellow who did it, who does it, I know him quite well. And uh, he's got a long article in the, uh, I'm looking at it now, the winter 2017, he's got a long article about our expedition and uh, this and that. Um, well, I don't know. Um, I'm sure after we quit, you'll think of other questions, and I'm sure I will think of other things I should should be telling you. But uh, this is this is, this now, is wonderful. You're in you're in you're not all three in Pittsburgh, though. Uh, correct. Uh, Morgan is in uh, northern Vermont. Yep. Oh right. Oh well, well that's a fair old hole. Then you're in Pittsburgh. Yes, sir. And Harold is uh, a little further east of me, uh, outside of Pittsburgh. I'm, I'm about 17 miles outside of Pittsburgh. Harold's probably about 30 or 40 miles oh, outside right. of Pittsburgh. So right. yes, yes. Right, right. Yeah. Well, if I get in in your neck of the woods, 
you are um, you you would you'd be an honored <laughs> guest. Know. You'd be an honored guest, and uh, you'd uh, we'd take care of you, you'd, and probably even drive you around in a Land Rover. Yes, because Tim, oh, well, of course, Tim is itching for a ride in a Land Rover. He never gets that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Sorry, Good that point. Again? I was just saying that, you know, I'm sure that that would be the big lure because, you know, you're itching for a ride in a Land Rover. You never get that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you, you didn't spend a whole <laughs> year in one. Uh, three uh, Adam Bennett's arranged for there's a couple of very um, um, good ladies in uh, who work, I think, for Land Rover owners or Land Rover International Magazine or whatever. And they're, they're, I think, in a two or three weeks' time, going to drive it down to some place in central France, where they, there's the sort of European get together of Land Rover enthusiasts, and they anticipate. I think they're being a bit optimistic, but they're anticipating four or five hundred Land Rovers. And um, nice. Adam is he thinks it's quite a, an attractive idea to have the girls drive it down. Of course. So. Um, so you need you need to ride along on that. That sounds like fun. Shall I say again? You need to ride along on that. That would be fun. Uh, well, I've got one or two other things going. Um, I don't. I don't think I'll let them go on with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's been down to Turin in northern Italy, nice. and it came back a few weeks ago. Right. Uh, and and the the Italians have gone bananas for it as well. There's an, uh, an Italian motoring magazine, and it's got eight pages, articles of eight pages, and about 15 or 20 photographs from this map. So outside you know, of... Among, among, among sort of enthusiasts, it's created a bit of a, you know, bit of a stir. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes. That's, we we certainly been following the, the activities uh, all along. Outside of and it's it's really an inspiration vehicle, you know the vehicles, the Oxford Cambridge vehicles, and your travels and your your book have have really been an inspiration for generations of Land Rover owners around the world. Well, you're very you're very flattering. <laughs> <laughs> it's still true. <laughs> it's well, still it's true. A, it was a long time ago. Sometimes I do, you know, I do look back and I think, well, we, yeah, we didn't perhaps at the time. Perhaps we didn't really appreciate what an adventure it was. As you get older, and in some ways the world changes. You know, you couldn't you couldn't do the route that that we took now through Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a great. I think, as I say, perhaps it's age, but you know, the older I get, the more sort of I appreciate. I think Jesus, that was it. That was quite an adventure. At the time when, you know, when it's concerned that, you know, we've got a puncture or, you know, the engine's playing up or can we get through this difficult bit, it's much more immediate. But with um, the perspective of time, you... Nostalgia. When, when it does become slightly a bit more appreciative. Uh, well, look, great talking to you. And, uh, you know, I'll... What, uh, can I, I as I imply, I'm a, could I ask another right? question? Do can I ask one more another question? Do you have time? Yes. Uh, aside from yes, yes, I've got I've got all evening. Okay, great. What time is it with you? Uh, it is uh, three thirty in the afternoon. So I say again. Three thirty in the afternoon. Three thirty, three thirty. Yeah. Well, I have uh, seven seven thirty in the evening. Yes, you got another question. Yes. So, aside from uh, the the two trucks that you drove and the Series Two that you bought, have you owned or used any other Land Rovers after after that? Did you buy any, or did you uh, participate I, in any I other expeditions? Never owned a Land Rover. I've occasionally driven. See, I used to work for BBC making documentaries. So, uh, if I went to Australia as I did to do a five part series on. Australia's bicentennial <coughs> of 200 years. Um, that was in 1988, 1788, 1988. See, a small diversion. When you guys sort of have more of independence and all that, you wouldn't take any more convicts from Britain. I know. <laughs> we had no one to send the convicts, so we decided to send them to Australia. Anyway. Yeah, in in the outback of Australia, you get Land Rovers, but uh, it, there's a lot of competition from 
uh, you know, from, from the Japanese. Um, Toyota. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, Toyota Land Cruisers and things. Yes. And in fact, um, you know, there's a lot of just let, just let's say there's a lot of competition. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, but uh, I learned to drive on a Land Rover when I was doing my military service way back in about 1950, I think. And, uh, I was sent. Uh, I went into the Marines, Royal Marines, and was sent to to, uh, to Malaya, where we had uh, the Brits had a bit of a well, hardly a war, but a confrontation with the uh, with the Communist Party, trying to take over Malaya. Mm-hmm. Well, when it was still a colony. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, I arrived to not being able to drive, and the, the officer in charge of my bit of the Outfit said, you bloody well got to learn to drive. So I was given a sort of crash course. I learned to drive in about three days on a Land Rover. <laughs> um, but um, no, in the course of my time for the BBC, I, you know, the Land Rover is obviously, if you're in, in, in difficult, well, not difficult terrain, but if you're off major highways right. in different parts of the world, you tend to go for a 4 by 4 Right. And very often it was a Land Rover. Um, so uh, yes, I've driven them, but but I've never owned one. Right. Uh, do you ha- do you have a car now? Do you have a current uh, driver? We're always curious. Yes, I have a Ford. <laughs> nice. Ford, Ford, a, a smallish Ford state uh, station wagon, uh, uh, Ford Fusion. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> very reliable. Yes. Not very glamorous. No, it's not. No, it's, it a, it's, it's a sensible car. Yes, yes, it, it, it's a sen- that's well put. Yes, a sensible <laughs> so, I'm a sensible fella, so I have a sensible car. There you go. Well, you've you've earned the right to drive whatever you want, Tim. <laughs> All I need is the money to buy whatever I want. <laughs> but, um, you, anyway, you, well, you know, call again any time. Oh, yes. Good talking to you. It was good talking to uh, you, sir, yes. And, uh, Hope, hope, one, hope to meet you one day. You, uh, um, that would be wonderful. On my, on my way, probably to um, to Nebraska, Wyoming. I go back. You see, quite often. I'm, I'm probably uh, not every year, but I'm back probably two years out of three. Well, you, you, you need to let us know, Tim, because you know th- this is a big country, but it's not that big. And if you're going to be somewhere in it, maybe we'll put together a little overland oh, yeah. expedition and come meet you. Oh well, yeah, well, yes. Or you see, uh, I mean, if I'm flying to, uh, if I'm going out to Nebraska or Wyoming, uh, obviously, uh, probably uh, London, Chicago, change in Chicago, Chicago, Denver, pick up a car uh, out of Avis or someplace, and away you go. Right. Um, well, well, how about there, how about this I, then, I, Tim? Got, how about well, how about this? Yeah, well, exactly. Sometimes I stop in Boston and see some friends there. Well, there's no reason why I can stop in Pittsburgh and okay. see see you folks. New, new, well, well, well how friends. about this then, Tim? You fly to Pittsburgh. We'll drive you to Nebraska. Show you the country. <laughs> ah. <laughs> well, that'd be something. That'd be something. Yes, I've never... uh, Well, if you if you get to London, give me a shout. Absolutely. Um, and um, but, but, but it's been delightful talking with you. And um, I don't know quite why they what the problem with the phone was. Well, it worked out all right. My it my cell phone held up. It did. It has. We really appreciate yeah. it. We're so honored to have you on the show to oh, talk cool. to us. Uh, you, you, uh, now I, I know you're 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 probably going to be sensible and not want to hear this, but I'm still going to tell it to you anyways. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you are in fact an inspiration to to us on the show, and I think to our listeners. We have listeners around the world, people in Australia, people in Norway, people in the UK, a lot in the United States. Um, yeah, you're 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 royalty to us. I, I, I'd like you to. Do you need to understand? that and i'll add that you 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 epitomize the notion of land rovers doing important things (laughs) you're very flattering i don't quite know how to react um um you know Uh, especially from especially from americans um um how to put it um i'm a great admirer of america i'm looking at my at my books and I've got, um, I must have oh, 60, 70 books um, from aspects of 
the United States. Yes. And um, cool. uh, I, I'm, I'm a great admirer of this. And that sounds terribly patronizing. Forgive no, me. No, not at all. But, not at all. No, no, I really, I really, I love America, and I love Americans. I, I don't think I've ever met an American that I didn't. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say fell in love with, but uh, <laughs> it's just, you know. It's yeah, yeah. Be not, careful with uh, that kind of talk. <laughs> yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. But um, no, uh, I can only think in all the. See, I, I was um, oftentimes in America shooting, filming. I don't know whether you ever saw a series. It was BBC, NBC co-production. Uh, it was called America by a man called Alistair Cook. Oh, um, oh yes. Oh, oh yes. Well, well I worked. I worked. At, Alistair Cook was quite well known in the, in the U.S. Uh, uh, operating mostly out of uh, WGBH in in Boston. Mm -hmm. the, Masterpiece the Theater. Masterpiece Theater. That's that's the one. Well, he did a series of thirteen uh, one-hour documentaries, uh, history of the United States. Okay. Uh, yeah. And. I, I worked on. I I was the director, uh, producer of three of the three of those, and I worked on other films with him. Subsequently, I did one about with him about Mark Twain, and he was a very keen golfer. He wasn't terribly good, but you didn't tell him that. Um, <laughs> and uh, he he uh, he uh, wanted to do a film about golf. And uh, I directed that. We started in, we started in, where the hell did we start? Oh, we started in Gloucester Cathedral in England because there's a, on the stained glass window, there's the first known um, sort of picture of a, of a golfer, um, of a, a, a monk in about 1350, I think. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, uh, that took us all over the States. Well, you know, Her um, Harold uh, is uh, from uh, Arnold Palmer's hometown. Oh, right, yeah, right, Latrobe. right. Mm -hmm. Well, subsequently, my son uh, got interested when he was about 18, 17, 18. He wanted to study golf. We well, couldn't do that in England. So Alistair Cook said he'd talk with, because he, he had good contact, he'd talk with the boss of the U.S. Golf Association, uh, the USGA, uh, which I think headquartered in, in New Jersey. And um, the answer came back, you, if, you're, if your boy wants to study uh, these things, he's got to go to um, Michigan State or Texas A&M. Uh, well, he went to Michigan State uh, and did his three years. And it, it wasn't, a, it's not a degree in golf. It's a degree in sort of man management and accounting and all that, and, and, and an element of sort of golf design. He now runs, uh, thanks to Cook and thanks to the USGA, uh, my son is now the boss or CEO, whatever you call it, of the number one golf design company in Europe. Oh. So, uh, Very cool. you know, that was all due to yeah. Americans. Yes. <laughs> oh, you get me started on American Americans. I go on all all evening. No. Anyway, look, very splendid talking to you, and um, you know, try me again sometime. Absolutely, thank um, you very much. You, Tim. We would love to. Yes, and and well, one thing that one of the things we really love to do on our program that you have greatly helped with today is capture the voice of of so many people that we have you know read books uh, by. Uh, so thank you for right. uh, spreading your story in in, an, in another medium for posterity. Well, <laughs> I don't know what to say. You're very flattering, <laughs> um, and you're wonderful. You're wonderful. It's, it's love you. It's love been you a all. pleasure. Uh, okay, we'll we'll, look, we'll you know uh, don't want to lose contact. Give me another shout sometime. We'll we'll um, continue. Absolutely. Thank you very and, much, Tim. Uh, so thank you very much. Meanwhile, okay. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Au revoir. And you. And you. Bye. Goodbye. You. Goodbye. And that's the Center Steer Podcast for our fifth anniversary, show number 60. I want to thank our guests this month, including uh, David Short. Uh, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. And just a reminder that the uh, Rovers of Wintergreen is coming up the 
first weekend in April, and our our Mid Atlantic rally will be the first weekend in October. So hope for, hopefully you can see some folks there. And you go out to roav.org. Thanks, John. And also special thanks, the biggest thanks we could ever have to Tim Slesser and Adam Bennett for coming on the show. Fantastic talks, and also thanks to our regular contributors. Thanks to Harold. Thanks to Morgan. Don't forget to check out seriesparts.com, and also thanks to Mike and check out justbritish.com. Would love to have you come stop by for all your British car information. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great resource. Go out and check out JustBritish.com. Yeah, no, absolutely. It really is. It's one of our primary references. <laughs> we use it every month. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> I did ship a bunch of stickers to Adam in, in the mail. So if you're in the UK and you happen to come across Mr. Bennett, feel free to ask him for a sticker. And I did ask him to ship one over to Tim Slesser for us. So we're hoping to get a picture of Tim holding one in his hand. I don't expect a, a one of our stickers to be on the Oxford truck, but if we do... That, that'd be kick-ass. That'd be cool. And also thanks to the One True Pax for his continued production support. I know you don't, you guys don't know it behind the scenes, but Pax does a lot for us and uh, helps the show sound much, much better. And we thank him for that continued support. Uh, visit our website, centersteer.com, that's C-E-N-T-R-E.com, to listen to previous shows and for show notes, which have links to stories discussed in today's show. We are also part of the 4x4 Radio Network. I invite you to check out those other shows at 4x4radionetwork.com. You can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can directly support the show at Patreon patreon.com slash center steer if you're not a subscriber go out to the all the different pod catchers and subscribe everywhere you can uh we appreciate it and that way you'll get the show automatically and don't forget to subscribe to the green oval podcast while you're out there our listener survey is still open morgan the, <laughs> <laughs> the reason it's still open is i'm waiting for morgan to put on the website uh the link is available on our website right morgan it will be shortly yes thanks for your help morgan i do appreciate it uh, i did tweet out the link and i'm going to tweet out the link again we appreciate you just filling out the survey we're only going to use it for our purposes only i'm probably going to close it up here in a month or before the next show we're not going to sell or share any of your information uh, we're just going to discuss amongst ourselves thank you for listening to show number 60 our fifth anniversary next month adam bennett part two I hope you enjoyed the show as much as we did this month. We'd love to hear from you and what you're up to in your Land Rover. Until next time, I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast. Wave as we pass by. How much time have you got?